בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back on our Wednesday night in Sunny Isles, Florida, on our uh, Stump the Rabbi questions and answers. Hopefully you guys thought of some questions that the rest of the world could benefit from, since, Baruch Hashem, people have uh, increased their questions lately, but only when the camera's off. You know, so uh, when you ask a question, it's in, fr in front of the camera, other people can hear the answer, other people can benefit. Plus, we have a couple of uh, Tzadikim volunteers that are uh, cutting the, all the questions into clips. You know, because some people, when they see two, three hours shiur, they get scared. You know, they think it's the coronavirus. But, so they run away. But if you send them like a 10, 15 minute clip, say, ah, it's the cure for Corona. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, anyway, today's shiur will be for a refuah uh, shlema for my dear wife, uh, Levana Batsara, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Batanat, David ben Asriya, Doris Bajora, Esther bat Zipora, Dvora bat Mercedes, Eli Sheva, Chaya Batsara, Batya Bat Sara and Serach Bat Batya. Kadosh Buchu Yivarech Otam, Bekom Mikol Kol, with Chaim Arukim, Shlemim, Eleim Torah, Mitzvot, Gmilut Chasadim, and also a uh, special thank you to all of our Tomchim, uh, uh, all of our partners that uh, invest into Olam Abba while no one's looking other than Kadosh Buchu. In all of these donations, people that donate every day, uh, where they uh, go out there, we work, work really hard to make a living, but then still re realize that the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you 100% of your panasa is so you can use at least 10% of it for the sake of his Torah. And uh, there's nothing greater than a person showing a Kadosh Baruch Hu love by caring about his children and investing his money into Kiruv. Because the reality is, is that if more people from Amisa do not do tshuva. We are in a losing battle right now because of the intermarriage that we're in right now. The uh, intermarriage rates right now are at historical highs. I believe we have passed, unfortunately, we've surpassed what we were doing at the time of Germany, right before World War II. And uh, unfortunately, in this generation, you can say, the pasuk that's written in Parashat Noach, en bait shen bomit, that there is no uh, household that doesn't have a dead body, meaning there's no household that doesn't have a problem with intermarriage. And uh, sometimes it's one of the immediate families, one of the brothers, one of the sisters has a uh, non-Jewish boyfriend or non-Jewish girlfriend or wife or husband that's not Jewish, or sometimes it's a cousin Sometimes it's a, uh, you know, it's a best friend, a partner. Every day there's more and more people contacting us, asking us for uh, help with, uh, with intermarriage situations. The problem is that people do not understand that the issues of, is of intermarriage is more than just the physical issues. It's more than just the physical issues. If you ever were in a intermarriage situation, you would know that there is an unusual attachment to this non-Jew. An unusual attachment from the non-Jew to you, as a Jew, and an unusual attachment from the uh, non-Jew, uh, from, from you to the non-Jew. Now, of course, in the secular world, or in the, uh, unfortunately, some modern Orthodox world, having boyfriend and girlfriends before uh, marriage is very normal. Even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu says it's not allowed. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Lo tiyya kdesha mibnot Yisrael, velo yiyya kdesh mibnei Yisrael. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 18, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, there shall not be a promiscuous woman that's a Bat Israel, and there's not going to be a promiscuous man that's part of Bnei Israel. What's promiscuous? 
Promiscuous means that you're going to have intimacy without marriage. That's promiscuous. Well, how many times? One time is already too much. One time being promiscuous before marriage is already too much for a Jew. A non-Jew can be promiscuous before marriage. And the reason why is because there's no deen of chupayin kiddushin for non-Jews. According to the Torah, if a Jew, if a uh, Noahide, a non-Jew, is with a uh, woman that's also not Jewish, they're considered married. They don't need to go to the civil court. They should for legal reasons, but nonetheless, they're considered married. If they want to get divorced the next day, they don't have to go to court. They can just get uh, not see each other anymore. Now they shouldn't be, you know, marrying a new wife every five minutes or a new husband every five minutes because promiscuity is, uh, is not an uh, admirable trait in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu for anyone. But needless to say, they don't have Chupayin Kiddushin. They don't have a uh, marriage ceremony. Jews, on the other hand, we have a marriage ceremony. It's called Chupayin Kiddushin, which means that the woman and the man are not allowed to touch each other before marriage. And what marriage is, is they go... Uh, to a rabbi who is musmach in this issue, who knows the uh, ish, the, the laws of chupayin uh, kiddushim, he's beki in the issue, meaning he's an expert in it. He knows what questions to ask. He knows what uh, what issues to raise before getting to the chupa. He has to make sure that both parties are uh, allowed to get married. One time, I had a student back in Boca Raton and told me that uh, he's getting married. And I said, okay, Chazaku Baruch, Mazal Tov. Who's the rabbi? And he said, uh, Rabbi uh, Pikachu. I said, yeah, but Rabbi Pikachu is uh, not such a good rabbi. He's the same rabbi that told you that you're allowed to drive on Shabbat for the last five years. And you only found out you're not allowed when you met me. So that's not such a good rabbi. He's good at being Pikachu, not rabbi. So, no, but you know, I feel bad. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I don't hurt him. You know, because still, he's a nice guy. I said, nice guy, no nice guy. You have to have a kosher rabbi be your chupayin kiddushin rabbi. Ah, you know, maybe you're a little extreme, maybe you're a little fanatic. I said, okay, do what you want. Uh, it's, it's not a problem. Did you talk to him already? He goes, no, no, we had the whole conversation. He's ready. He says we get married. Everything is good. I said, okay, did you, uh, did you tell him about your, uh, your past marriage? He said, no, he never asked. He said, he never asked you if you were married before? He says, no. So he doesn't know that you don't have a get? He said, no. I said, exactly, he's good at being Pikachu. You're not allowed to get married until you get a get. And he is not allowed to be a rabbi. He's allowed to be Pikachu. There is no issues of embarrassing, no embarrassing here. You have to make sure that you pick the right people. When the Chachamim say that a person that's going to do your Chupayin Kiddushin has to be Biki. In the issues, meaning he has to be an expert. Meaning he studied all the laws. He knows what questions to ask. He knows whether you are allowed to get married or not. There are many people that get married, they're not allowed to get married. Or worse yet, they uh, get to the Chupa and Kiddushin, and they, uh, they bring their, uh, I don't know, their brothers, or their father, or their best friend, to be the guys that are the witnesses of the Chupa and Kiddushin, because they want to give them kavod. Problem is, if those people are Mechale Shabbat, they don't keep Torah and Mitzvot, that marriage is not valid. They're married, because they're not allowed to be witnesses. If you're Mechalel Shabbat, the Gemara, the Zohar, and needless to say, the uh, Rambam writes in Ilchot Shabbat, chapter 30, Alakha number 15, last Alakha in Ilchot Shabbat for the Rambam, he says that a Mechalel Shabbat is Dino Kegoi. He is considered 100% a Goy, he's considered an idol worshipper. Meaning, an idol worshipper cannot be a witness in a Jewish ceremony. So, although you want to give them Kavod for. Uh, being your best friend, or your brother, or your father, you also want to be Jewish, and you want to be married. If you want to be Jewish and you want to be married, you have to follow the laws of Judaism and marriage. Now, 
if a person wants to get married, they have to make sure that they follow all the laws. Once you get to the chuppah, you do whatever you need to do with the chuppah, you finish that, lechaim lechaim. After that, your wife is allowed to you as long as she's pure, as long as she went to the mikveh. She went to the mikveh, she's pure, she waited the appropriate amount of days, you know, to wait for the, uh, the bleeding to stop, or at least uh, uh, four days, uh, and uh, then seven days on top of it. Long story short, you, you know all the laws of, uh, of family purity, your wife is an expert in it, you the husband, you also know it because you both need to know it. Baruch Hashem, as long as she's pure, you're allowed to be with her. If she did not go to the mikveh, then she's, all, she's still forbidden to you. Now, for all of you single guys and girls, I'm going to give you a little secret. The secret is, if you're not married to a Jewish woman, if she's not married, she's not allowed to go to the mikveh. She's not allowed to go to the mikveh. What does that mean, she's not allowed to go to the mikveh? What do you care about the mikveh? Just throw her in a pool, no? What's, what's, what's the difference with the mikveh? When a woman does not go to the mikveh, that makes her nida. And nida, Rabotai Yikarim, the Gemara says there's no impurity worse than nida, stronger than nida. It doesn't make her a bad person, it doesn't make her an evil person, chas shalom. it doesn't make her anything. It just makes her not allowed to you. Forbidden to you, forbidden from being intimate. That's what it doesn't allow. But the impurity, the, the, the koach, the, the strength of the impurity of a woman that's nida is extremely powerful. So much so that in the past generations, it's no longer Allah today, but in the past generations, there were some Chachamim that would say that if a woman that was nida came to the Bet Knesset and she sat in a chair, no one else is allowed to sit on that chair. Why? It may, the, the nida may affect them. Now, this is not al Khalama said today, but nonetheless, some, some still, some hold to it. Point being, Rabotai Karim is people that are trying to be holy and close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, were very, very conscious of the fact that if your wife is Nida, you're not allowed to even touch her finger. Needless to say, to be with her. So if you're only allowed to be with your own wife when she's pure, and if you touch her when she's not pure, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, it's Din Karet. What's Din Karet? Din Karet, Rabotai Karim, is the person loses Olam Abba. What does losing Olam Abba mean? You go to Shah Gmul from the Ramban, you go to the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 16b or 17a, you go to Rashid Chokhmah, Masechet Genom, you go to all of these different places, to discuss what is what is no share of the world to come means. No share of the world to come means genom. How long? Permanent. It's not worth it, is the point. It's not worth it. Even if you don't know what happens in genom, already the word genom is scary. It's not worth it. So you have to wait if you have, if you're married, you have to wait for your wife to go to the mikveh. Now, if you're not married, then guess what? She's not allowed to go to the mikveh. No mikveh would accept her. It's, a, it's, it's not allowed. Which means that all of these single girls, as wonderful as they are, as smart as they are, as beautiful as they are, or some of them as ugly as they are, whatever they are, they're all nida. They're all forbidden to you. You have a girlfriend that you're intimate with before Jewish marriage. You, my friend, are playing with the satan. And every single time you guys are together, you're simply ruining your life. And then you come complaining to the rabbi, or to your uh, psychiatrist, or to your parents, or to somebody else. Oh, why is my life so bad? I'm so lonely. How are you lonely? You have 15 friends next to you. I don't know. I'm so lonely. I feel sad. How come? You have a boyfriend and a girlfriend. How come you're so sad? Oh, I don't know. But you just got a dog. Yeah, I don't know. But you just got a new job with a million dollar raise. Yeah, I don't know. I want him suicidal. How come? Because your neshama, your neshama is suffering. Every time you do something against the Kadosh Baruch Hu, your neshama starts suffering. It starts suffering. What is it like? Imagine yourself right now. Are you saying thank you to Hashem for, for the air that you're breathing? Probably not, right? Me neither. But the truth is, 
You know when we would say thank you? If suddenly, chas shalom, the air stopped. No oxygen. No oxygen. Within a second, all of us realize it. Within 10 seconds, we're already starting to think about what's going to happen to me in Olam Abba. After 25, 30, 40, depends on your shape, how long you can hold your breath, you can start seeing bodies. People start passing out. Now, right before you pass out, Hashem turns back the air on. <gasps> thank you. Wow, thank you, Akadosh Baruch Hu. It's the best air in the world. That's when you're going to appreciate air. That is what's happening to your neshama every single time you make a sin that's dinkalit. Your neshama stops breathing and it starts dying and dying more and dying more and every day you kill it more and more and more and more and more. Finally you do a mitzvah and say, I'm sorry Hashem. <gasps> wow. The neshama says, thank you, Kadosh Baruch Hu. You gave me another chance. He gave me another chance, this fool. He gave me another chance. He said, I'm sorry at least. Hopefully he doesn't do it again tomorrow. Hopefully she doesn't do it tomorrow. But sometimes a person knows the truth, knows they're not allowed to be with anyone before marriage. They see that there's an unusual attachment to this person. Even more so when it's intermarriage issues, meaning when it's a Jew and a non-Jew. Why is that? How come... If you are a promiscuous person and you have a new husband or wife every other day, every week you go to the clubs, you find a new one. Like you, you have more husbands than you have clothes. You have more wives than you have uh, sneakers. You switch them. But then one day you fall in love, right? Let's, you pretend like it's love. You pretend. You look as if you know what love is, Bechlal. You only find out what love is after at least 15, 20 years of marriage. But let's say you pretend like you actually have love. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say you actually say, I love you, and you actually mean it. Let's say. Pretend. Let's make pretend like we're little kids. Now, you say, I love you. She says, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Right? But then something wrong happens. You break up. All that I love you, love you, love you, goes away. You find a new I love you. Two, three days later, I have a friend, old friend. I don't speak to him very often now, but non-Jewish guy he used to say I love you I love you to his wife all the time he also said I love you I love you to the, to the alcohol all the time it's an alcoholic anyway this guy made a fortune on Wall Street it's good uh, well, actually one of the uh, decent uh, brokers knows what he's doing deals with a lot of rich people made a lot of money his wife was even more successful than him made a ton of money anyway they say, I love you all the time. I love you, I love you in public, in private, all the time. I love you, I love you. You look cute, right? Cute. About a year ago, on Facebook, he decided to post, I don't love you. Why? She just divorced me. She, she left. But he said, thank God. The, uh, the uh, you know, I'm free. He was celebrating that he's free. Like, as if it was, I love you was really make pretend. You know, it was fake, I love you. Because he feels like he was in jail for the last, I don't know, 10 years, or whatever, all along his way. Okay? No, I love you anymore. And he said specifically, he wanted the whole world to know, and Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted me to know, because I don't really ever look at anybody's post, but apparently she wanted me to know, that he's never getting married again. No more I love yous. That's it. Enough is enough. As Akadosh Baruch Hu would have it, Amash, I've never seen, I, I didn't even know we were friends on Facebook. Just the other day, just the other day, eight months passed, I don't know, six months passed, whatever it's been, he says, I have a new I love you. And he already bought her a ring, and he already, they're getting married. They got married already. That's it. Such a person like this knows what I love you is. You're making fun of the whole love. You're making fun of what love really means if you think that that's what happens. So how come he has such an easy time discontinuing the I love you for 10 years? And many people have such an easy time Canceling out the I love you. But once in a while, when it's the worst person in the world for you, when you're a Jew and she's not a Jew, when you're a Jew and he's not a Jew, 
He is Mustafa. He is uh, Hitler. He is uh, Jesus. He is one of these people. Not allowed. For the you cannot allow yourself to leave him. You cannot allow yourself to leave her. She left you. She cheated on you. She lied to you. She, you have videos of her cheating on you. You have pictures of him cheating on you. All the worst things in the world, but you can't, you can't help yourself. You have to stay with him. He's the worst person on earth. But you can't, I, can't, I love him. How come? Now, obviously, it has nothing to do with love. Anyone who thinks that is, should go back to rewind, start again, get here again. Hopefully, you're not stupid. It cannot, it's not, it has nothing to do with love. What does that have to do with son? Because no, when somebody's with a non Jew, it says like, they're like tied to them like a dog. Son gave us the answer. Spoiled the whole thing. <laughs> What's the answer? Gemara says, when a Jew is with a non Jew, she is tied to him like a dog. What does it mean she's tied to him like a dog? Why, Hashem is making fun of non-Jews? He created them too. Chaz Shalom, Hashem is not making fun of non-Jews. When a Jew is with a non-Jew, either a girl, a Jewish girl with a, Jewish, with a non-Jewish boy, or vice versa, those neshamot are forbidden to each other. But they stick. They stick in a bad way. They stick in such a bad way, it's like one of those things where if you use the right screw and you put it into the right nut, it goes smoothly. You put it in, you put it out, no problem, right? But what if you put the wrong screw into that same nut? You could put it in, but what happens? You can't get it out. Why? It's the wrong one. You ruined, every, you, you ruined both of them now. That's what happens with intermarriage. The tum'ah that's created, the impurity that's created as a result of intermarriage is so extraordinary that it's very hard to undo it. Therefore, it's very hard for them to break up because they have an unnatural attraction to each other even though it doesn't make any sense. He doesn't even like her anymore. She doesn't even like him anymore. They actually hate each other, but they can't leave each other. And they don't know why. That's the reason. Gemara says, when you do it, you are in essence gluing those neshamot in an inappropriate way, which is very difficult to undo. You need a lot of kedusha, a lot of kedusha to fix it. Because kedusha is the only thing that can be tuma. So when a young man or a woman is promiscuous, in essence what they're doing is they're playing with lava. Because they're putting themselves in a situation that they could potentially fall into the wrong place and put them and the other person in jeopardy. Because intermarriage is forbidden both with Jews and non-Jews. Jews are not allowed to marry non-Jews for obvious reasons. Kadosh Baruch Hu says they're not allowed to marry non-Jews. We're only allowed to marry each other. But non-Jews are also not allowed to marry Jews. Under what law? Under the law of murder. There are seven Noahide laws. And one of those laws is that non-Jews are forbidden for murdering. And marrying a Jew is murdering the Jew. Is the equivalent of murdering his neshama. Because each and every single time they're intimate together, it's din karit. It's considered 100% like you just murdered that Jew. Now go ahead and fix that. Very difficult to fix. So, now what? How, how could such a person fix it? There are two places, there are a couple of ways of fixing it. Akadosh Baruch Hu says that tshuva is several steps. The Rambam elaborates on it. He says, first and foremost, you have to stop. You have to stop being intimate. You have to stop being together. You have to stop. Stop the sin, whatever the sin is. If you're a Pogem Abrit, stop being a Pogem Abrit. Which, by the way, intermarriage is also Pogem Abrit. Because you're not allowed to be together. And therefore, every time you're together, even if you're trying to get pregnant, it's still wasting seed because you're not allowed to have a baby. And if a Jewish guy has a baby with a non-Jewish girl, guess what? That kid is not considered his kid. It's not considered his kid. 
according to Torah, is not considered his kid. If that kid converts one day, 20 years later, little cute little girl, they used to change our diapers, she grows up, 20 years later she converts, she wants to be a Jew. And he wants, to, and the Jew wants to marry her, he's allowed to marry her. Why? She's not his kid. Now we don't do that because it looks bad for the goyim. But the point is, according to the Torah, it's a lot. She's not his kid. The, the, the kids from the non-Jew are not considered his kids. Now, I know this is going to rub some people the wrong way, but that's Allah, it's Torah. You don't like it, go complain to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, have a one-on-one -on -one with him and see what happens. Let me know. Let me know how it turned out. Write me a text. He said this, I said that. I said, God, you're wrong, and then it ended. <laughs> Postcard. Masichet Geinom. So the point is, Rabotai Yekarim, when a Jew has a kid with a non-Jew, you have a serious problem. Now if a Jewish woman is with a non-Jewish, Shem Yishmo, the kids are still considered Jewish. But nonetheless, there's still a problem here. Why? Because the husband is not Jewish. So now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you're sinning, you're violating Shabbat, you're wasting seed, you're eating non-kosher, you're stealing in your business, you're uh, angry every two minutes, you curse a lot, all of these different sins, first step, stop. First step of Chuba, stop. Second step, Make offense, meaning learn a lot about this mitzvah, learn about all the different things that you're not allowed to do, learn about all the trigger points of yourself that lead you to do it, spending certain time with certain people, going to certain places, and so on. Third step, say, Akadosh Baruch Hu, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for sinning, I'm sorry for going against you. And the fourth step, get to a point where after you've done all this tshuva, which also includes getting other people to do tshuva for the same thing so you could undo your own crimes, the last step is get to a point where Kadosh Baruch Hu could stamp, you are a really serious Baal tshuva. Now Chachamim say, how does Hashem get to a point where He knows for sure this guy is a real serious Baal tshuva? How does He know? He knows when He sends you to test again. And this time you pass. He sends you the same girl that's not allowed to you. The same circumstance. You're still attracted. You're still in love and all the crazy feelings. But you know HaKadosh Baruch Hu said no. So you say, thank you, but no thank you. Why? I'm not allowed to be with you. I'm Jewish. You're not Jewish. I'm sorry. You passed that test. Now you did tshuva. Now you did tshuva. But you fail again. Restart. Again. Hopefully you survive this one. That's, that's what happens. So, the first step of doing tshuva for intermarriage, and intermarriage doesn't actually mean you always have to legally be married. Intermarriage means you're simply intimate with the opposite gender. That's not Jewish and you're Jewish. The uh, way that uh, a person can do tshuva is first off, break up. Break up, start learning about the topic, run away from them. Say, I'm sorry, this cannot be anymore. It's not you, it's me. Really, it's not even me, it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Blame him. Why? He said that if I continue being with you, he's going to kill me. And you. So I like you, and that's why I don't want to kill you. And that's why I have to leave. You learn about it, you start getting other people to also know the same information, sending them the shiul so they can learn about it. You say, I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You start doing serious tshuva, keeping mitzvot, donating money for the sake of Kiruv to help other people get out of the same trap that you were in. But always, always be prepared for that test to come back to you again. She's going to come back to you again. He's going to come back to you again. You're going to have an unnatural desire to be with this person again. Why? That's the test. That's going to be the final step. HaKadosh Baruch says, here you go. I want to see if you really mean that, Chuva. You donated $10,000 already. Good for you. You said, I'm sorry, 10,000 times already. Good for you. You stopped already for 10 months already. Good for you. 
Now I want to see if you mean it. Why? It's easy to be religious in a closet. You know, sometimes people would like to be religious, but in the closet, no, no one knows. No one knows. He has no problem wearing tzitzit, but only at home. I have a couple of people like this. I tell them, how come you don't wear tzitzit? No, I wear tzitzit, Rabbi. Come on, don't lie on about me. Huh? I said, I'm, I'm looking at you right now. You don't wear tzitzit. What, I'm blind? He goes, no, I don't wear tzitzit outside, but I wear tzitzit inside. I wear tzitzit inside the house. Oh, so no one sees that you're Jewish. That's why you wear tzitzit inside. You're embarrassed of your Judaism. Or better yet, the woman is modest all year round except when there's an event. She's modest all year round, but if there's an event, there's a wedding, there's a bar mitzvah, there's something like that. Oh no, that's when she goes out like she's going to a club. Or she puts on, instead of the kisur or mitpachat, she puts on a wig. Or where she's not modest if she goes to work. She gets modest at home. At home, she puts on a sack. At work, though, half a sack. Half a sack. Why? She's really not comfortable with her own Judaism. He's not comfortable with his own Judaism. Because who says, I don't like stuff like that. It's faker. It means you're embarrassed of me. You're embarrassed of me. It's not nice. It's not nice to be embarrassed of your father. Because who wants us to be proud of our Judaism. Where do we learn that from? Purim. The first time in the entire Tanakh that the word Yehudi is mentioned is in Megillat Estel. Yehudi is not mentioned in the five books of Moses. You're not going to see the word Jew in the five books of Moses. Where are you going to see it? You're going to see it in Megillat Estel. It's part of the Tanakh. Where is it mentioned the first time? Mordechai Yehudi. Mordechai the Jew. Why Mordechai the Jew? The Ben Ishchai says, everyone knew that Mordechai was the Jew. How they know? He had such long payers, so big, you can see he's a Jew from a mile away. Why? He was proud to be a Jew. So he wanted to make sure they're nice, big, fluffy, you can see him from far away. Kamara Masechet Megillah says, Ezeu Yehudi, who is a Jew? He says, Mordechai is a Jew. And Batya Bat Paro is a Jew. He says, why are they Jews? How come you don't say, you know, somebody else? He says, because Mordechai and Batya, they fought against Avodah Zarah. They made fun of Avodah Zarah. You make fun of Avodah Zarah, you're a Jew. Why? You're fighting against the opposite of God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates things that are the opposite of him. Idol worship is the opposite of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Hashem is everything. An idol is absolutely nothing. It's the creation's creation. Meaning, Hashem didn't create the idol. Who created it? His creation created the idol. People created the idol. So it's the lowest form of creation. It's the exact opposite of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Same thing, Hashem hates liars. Why? His chotemet, his uh, signature is emet. He hates liars. That's why it says, Midval Shekel Tirchak. It's the only mitzvah in the Torah where it says, Stay away from this. Don't only not do it, stay away from it. Stay away from lies. Hashem hates lies so much, stay away from lies. Stay away from lies, stay away from liars, stay away from lying. Stay away from it. If your business, if this industry is full of lies, run away. New business. Yeah, I'm going to make money. Don't worry, because those who will send you money. Your friend is a liar, stay away from him, find a new one. Well, I'm going to be lonely. It's okay, it's better to be lonely than be next to a liar. Because if he's lying for you, he will lie about you. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates things that are the opposite of him. So when you fight against those things, like Mordechai fought against idolatry, Batya Bat fought against idolatry, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that's a Jew. That's a Jew. So a Jew has to be proud that he's a Jew. Not hide his Judaism. When a person is proud to be a Jew, he's not going to have a problem to tell his non-Jewish girlfriend or boyfriend, or her boyfriend, that they're not allowed to be together. Why? Because she's a Jew. And he's not. He's a Jew and she's not. Not allowed. 
It's nothing personal. It's not that you're a bad person. It's a, a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, not allowed. So a person needs to know that aside from stopping, aside from learning about it and encouraging other people not to fall for into marriage, aside from making donations to make sure that you do whatever tikkun you need to do, you have to prepare yourself to go public with this. Meaning, a Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to send you that test. He's going to send you that test and he's going to put you in a situation that you were in and it's very, very difficult to overcome it. He's going to send you that beautiful Goya. He's going to send you that beautiful Goy waiting for you. And they don't even know why. Why? He wants to allow you to do full tshuva. Now if you're embarrassed or you're weak, you're going to fail. If you're strong, you prepare yourself, you succeed. So first way of doing tshuva for intermarriage is what I just said. What's the second way? Second way, Rabotai Karim, believe it or not, is finding out if this person is interested in becoming a Jew. If they are, if they're not a religious Christian, if they're not a religious Muslim or an atheist, they believe in God and they want to take on the mitzvot, you should help them convert. You should help them convert. You should help them find the truth, give them the CDs, give them the information, and let them go through the process of conversion. Because if they become a Jew, guess what? You're passing a test on day one. The day they become a Jew, you get married right away. What happens? What happens on that day? Now you stopped being with a non-Jew, right? You already stopped even before they converted because obviously you realize you're not allowed to be with them. On top of it, throughout the way, you learned all the material, right? You're encouraging other people not to repeat the same mistake. But what about the test of getting the same person, the same person, an opportunity to be there and not failing? That's what you have. You married them. But now it's allowed. Now it's a mitzvah to be together. Same person, but this time it's a mitzvah. So, but again, it's only if they obviously want to be a Jew. Not if they want to just get married and uh, make your mommy happy. So, it's very important for people to know that when it comes to promiscuity, it's a trap of the Satan to make you fall into a place where it's going to lead you astray, lead you away from Hashem, lead you to a place where it's going to be very, very difficult to do any of the things I just said. And that's because of the Tumah, the impurity that intermarriage creates. As long as you're intimate with each other, there's no chance in the world that you guys are going to do tshuva. No chance. Why? It's going to be very difficult for you guys. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to allow a person convert and become one of his chosen people while he's murdering his own kid, while he's murdering his own daughter. There's no chance in the world. If you're going to continue acting like husband and wife, and you think that Hashem is going to allow you to convert, you're dreaming. Dreaming. So that means that even if they want to convert, you still have to stop everything. You still have to act like everything is over. Better yet, there's no way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to allow this non-Jew to become one of his chosen people as, so long as he's outright violating the law. You could get a fake conversion, but when it gets to Shemaim, they'll tell you it's fake. But they don't tell you with words. They'll tell you with sentence. A long, long sentence. So that's why Rabotai Karim, it's very important that people know. Intimacy before marriage is only trouble. I know it's very difficult for guys and unfortunately for girls. Uh, you know, in the times of Rashi, he wrote that 900 years ago, that they asked him a specific halakha about how do you know if a girl is a virgin, not virgin before marriage. He goes, no, and from where we are, we have no, uh, no uh, doubts that even the goyim, all of the goyim, 
are virgins. Needless to say, are but not Israel. Says we have no no issues with that stuff. Nine hundred years ago, it was a given. If you aren't a virgin before uh, before marriage, you're considered a zona, you're considered a prostitute. Today it's not the same. Why? Because people are much more free with their body and their intimacy and so on. Because they have no idea that this is one of the tools that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses to determine whether you are holy or not holy. If you are promiscuous and you're pretty much with whoever... Whoever is the one that uh, you know makes you smile, the last thing you are is holy, because holiness Rabbi Karim starts with the issues of intimacy. That's the distinguishing factor between Am Yisrael and the rest of the nations. If you look at the map of the Neshama, there's different parts of the Neshama have different names, and the Yesod, Yesod is the foundation. The Yesod is where the the sex organs are. And it's also called the Kedusha. Holiness. Why? Because that's what holiness is. That's what makes Am Yisrael holy. The Brit Milah, how we treat the Brit, and so on and so forth. Same thing with a woman. If a woman is not uh, holy, doesn't treat herself holy, she could wear Kisuro, she could wear dress, she doesn't wear... She, if she is... Donating our body to science on a, re- on a weekly basis. Holiness is the last thing she is. So it's very, very important for a woman to appreciate ourselves and understand. If you're going to be a Bat Israel, you are a princess. A princess is not allowed to, uh, to give herself to, uh, to, to the public. She's only allowed to be with another prince. Same thing for a Jew. You are not allowed to go and uh, have uh, different wives before you get married. It's very important for a person to know these things. These are basics that you're probably not going to learn anywhere else. And that's why I talk about them. Because people are very very free with each other. You know, so much so, sometimes they, you know, allow different people to kiss each other's wives. You know, as like a uh, formality. Hello, hello, goodbye, goodbye. They hug each other. They take pictures with each other. And then people are surprised that the divorce rate is over 80%. You know, people get divorced not because they don't like each other. They were married for 20 years. They don't get divorced because they don't like each other. They like each other. They just like somebody else too. You know, usually that somebody else is best friend. The best friend. That's usually that somebody else. That's what happens. People need to understand. When you get married, that means that she is yours and yours only. Yours to touch, yours to look at. Yours. Vice versa, same thing. That's why a guy is not even allowed to touch a female that's not his wife, even if he's married. Not allowed to uh, hug your own sister even. You're an older man, she's an older woman, not allowed to hug her. Rambam says only stupid people do that. Needless to say, somebody else's wife, it's Eshet Ish. Woman is married to somebody else, you give her a hug, you have a very serious problem with a Kadosh Baruch It's almost considered as if you were intimate with her. Which is Din Karit. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes the, the issues of Kedusha very, very seriously. These are not my laws. If it was my laws, I promise you, it would probably be easier than Hashem. Probably be easier. I don't, I don't think I would care as much because I'm a lowly human. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Rabotai. He wants us to be extremely holy because He knows that that's the only way that we can get to Gan Eden. Once we start playing with the rules and becoming more loose, becoming more lenient, little by little we start sinning. Little by little we start having all types of doubts. Little by little our learning goes into the garbage. Little by little we start pretty much falling off. And a person can be as high as Moshe Rabbeinu. But if he allows himself to fall, he can fall and become worse than Korach. Don't think for a moment that when you read Parashat Korach that Korach was always a Rasha. That's wrong. Korach was a Tzaddik. How do I know he was a Tzaddik? He was a Navi. He spoke to Hashem. He spoke to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He was a Navi. He was a prophet. And he saw in prophecy 
that his descendant is going to be Shmuel and Avi. That the Gemara says Shmuel is like Moshe and Aaron together. That's why Korach said, how could I lose to Moshe if my grandson is going to be Shmuel? It means I have to win this battle. Like he thought, he rationalized it. He didn't realize that his sons are not going to be on his team before the battle's over. They're going to all do tshuva, go to Moshe's side. He figured that since his sons are together with him, and since his sons have to live, and he has to live in order for Shmuel to come out from him, so surely he's going to win the battle against Moshe Rabbeinu. He saw this in prophecy. He didn't like dream this. He saw this in prophecy. He was a tzaddik. But tzaddik with gava. Tzaddik with pride. Tzaddik with pride. Not tzaddik. Not anymore. Not anymore. And all of it was the fault of his wife. His wife is the one that led him to this to mistake. Point being, Rabotai Karim. When a person, when a person makes a mistake, if he allows his mistake to continue, all of the kedusha, all of the mitzvot, all of the good things that he's built himself over a period of time, could literally fall into the garbage. And that's on this. The Ramban writes. The Ramban writes in uh, Shara Gmul something very interesting. Where he says that the uh, what is the meaning of the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 14 that says God has made this corresponding to this the Ramban writes it means that he created the righteous and he created the wicked he created Gan Eden and he created Genom each person has two portions, one in Gan Eden and one in Gehenom. If the righteous man is meritorious, he takes his own portion of reward, meaning he goes to his Olam Abba, and the portion of his friend to Gan Eden. The wicked man, on the other hand, who is guilty, however, takes his portion of punishment, all the punishment for what he did, and the portion of his friend to gain him. So Chazal says, well, what does it mean? Why, why, why is he, if he's righteous, why does he get two Gan Edens? And if he's wicked, he gets two Gan Ob's. He gets punished for himself and for his friend. How come? Says, if he's righteous, he did Tshuva, he stopped sinning. What did he also do? He did Kiruv. He helped somebody else do Tshuva. What if that guy didn't want to do it? He told his friend, listen, I heard Rabbi Reuven says, no Shabbat, no Allah Abba. His friend says, how about this? You and this Rabbi, you guys go fly kite. I'm going to go back and do whatever I want. I'm going to do whatever I want. No Shabbat for me. Ramban says, no problem. You did Kiruv. You tried telling him he didn't want to listen. Guess what? His Allah Abba goes to you. Because you're righteous, you did tshuva, his olam goes to you. And the genom you were supposed to get goes to him. Another reason why it's worth to do kiru. Why? You win either way. You win either way. If he does tshuva, you get 310 more worlds. But if he doesn't, you still get his. Why? Because now, he, even though it says... All of Am Yisrael have a share of the world to come. Meaning they all have a place in Olam Abba designated for them. But if they do not fulfill the rules, they don't follow the rules, they don't keep Shabbat, they don't keep Tarat Mishpacha, they don't keep all of the major laws, they keep making sins of Karet and don't do Tshuva, what happens to this Olam Abba? They can't go to them. The ticket won't work. So where does it go? It goes to any person that helped them, at least tried to help them do tshuva. It goes to their friend. That's who's your friend. Someone that rebukes you. So with that being said, Rabotai, you got a little bit of a lesson of, of uh, Kedusha in the issues of promiscuity. Hopefully this gave you guys some uh, food for thought for some questions. Bechavod, who wants to start with the first question? Uh, if you could pass the mic to him, please.
Yes. Um, is this on? Yeah, it's on that, I, that the camera can okay. hear it, but not, it's not going to make you louder for them. Can I ask two questions? Chabot. So the first one is Batya is considered, Batya Ben Paro is considered a Yehudi, a Yehudiya. Yehudiya, yeah. What did she do exactly with the idols? And the other question is, what was it with, with Shlomo HaMelech marrying all these non-Jewish women who were doing about Zara and, and all that? What's the story with that? Okay. Well, he must have had some good intention. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So the, um, the Gemara says that Batya Bat Paro, she wasn't called Batya, obviously. She was, she was, who called her Batya? HaKadosh Baruch Hu called her Batya. He gave her the name. She had, uh, I don't know, Fatima, some Arab name. She was uh, Paro's daughter. She wasn't born Fatima. She wasn't born Batya. She was born, uh, you know, Satma or something. She wasn't uh, Fatima, Fatima. She was born. She wasn't born uh, Batya. But she saw that her father was a faker. Paro was a faker. If somebody could close the door, it'd be great. Um, she saw that her father was a liar and he pretended to be God. How did he pretend to be God? Kamara says that he told everybody that he, unlike everybody else, he doesn't have to go to the bathroom. And he made a, 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 a rule that there's no bathrooms in his entire castle. So you go to all of these places where the kings would be in, in Egypt, there's no bathrooms inside. No toilets. So everybody said, if there's no toilet, he doesn't go to the bathroom. So how did he do this? He may also made a law. You're not allowed to go outside between such and such hours at night. And that's where he would go, to the river, to the Nile River, and he would relieve himself there. He would hold himself all day, but when nobody else was allowed out, he would go there. And that's why, you see in the verses, every time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe Rabbeinu to go to Paro, Paro will be surprised. You look at the Midrashim. Paro is surprised. Paro is at the river. Why is it the river? HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent Moshe Rabbeinu to Paro right when he was going to the bathroom. Why? To show him we know you're, you're, you're a cheater, you're a liar, we know you're, you're filth. So he would be embarrassed on top of the fact that he's exposed. Anytime you catch a liar, they, they feel horrible about themselves. That's why they get, become defensive. So Batya knew years before that Batya knew that her father was a liar she knew he goes to the bathroom she knew that uh, everybody else is scared of him and she fought against him she fought against him she fought against the Abu she said to, to him I'd rather be one of the slaves than be your daughter because he didn't have any sons she was supposed to be the next uh, Paro so, no, no, I'd rather be one of the slaves she took on Moshe Rabbeinu building in the house and so on so she fought against against uh, Abu Dazara when Am Yisrael left Egypt she left with them and she is one of the Gemara says she is one of ten people in history that went to Gan Eden alive alive with her clothes on she never died now how did she get the name Batya the day that she officially went against her father she said, Hashem, I want to be one of your slaves. I want to be like one of these slaves that my father's killing. I want to be, I'd rather be one of these slaves than his daughter. I want to be with you, Hashem. Hashem gave her the prophet, the understanding. Go to the mikveh. Where do you go? Go to the river. Go to the river. That's your conversion. She goes to the river. She bathes. She purifies herself. What happens? It's a little baby in a basket. Moshe Rabbeinu, here's your present. Here's your conversion present. Here's your son, Moshe Rabbeinu. You fought for me in a house of idolatry. You fought for the Emet. I'm going to give you the king of Emet. In this world, Moshe Rabbeinu. You raise him. Raise him inside the house of lies. To let the Emet win. So Batya Bat Paro fought against idolatry. Now, Shlomo Melech as far as him marrying a thousand women, first off, you should know all of them converted to Judaism before marriage. The Rambam elaborates on this issue. It says that every one of these women converted to Judaism before marriage. He never, he never married a non-Jew. So let not be mistaken about that. But then you're going to say, wait a minute, but some of these women, like Paro's daughter that he married, 
she uh, was an idol worshiper and someone else also was an idol worshiper. It was a couple of women that brought their idols. They converted to Judaism, but they never fully abandoned their idolatry. Meaning they brought their idols and they fell back for it. And why is Shlomo HaMelech rebuked by Hashem? For a couple of reasons. Number one, that he did not rebuke them. He didn't rebuke them enough when he saw that they went back. After they converted, they put on Kisru Rosh, they kept Shabbat, they kept Mitzvot, they kept Kasu, they kept everything. But eventually they fell off. Started going to the idols again, he didn't rebuke them. So that's one reason that Kadosh Baruch Hu rebukes him. The second reason is, is because Shlomo Melech was gifted knowledge like no other person other than Moshe Rabbeinu. He was the smartest man of all time. Again, aside from Moshe Rabbeinu. And uh, he rationalized in his genius mind that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants the Mashiach to bring world peace. Meaning no more war. How do you bring more war? Shlomo Melech never went to war. He had peace. He had peace, he had wealth, he had wisdom, he had everything. He said, yeah, but how do I do with the rest of the world? Ah, everyone was scared of Shlomo Melech. Everyone wanted peace with Shlomo Melech. He said, how do I make peace with everybody? I'll marry all of the nations. I'll marry all the nations and little by little convert the entire world. Make everybody Jewish. Sounds like a nice plan, but that's not Ritzon Hashem. That's not the will of Hashem. Hashem does not want the whole world Jewish. There's a role for the Jew. There's a role for the non-Jew. That's not the will of Hashem. Don't rationalize Hashem's plan to your plan. So what did he do? He had a plan to go marry one of the princesses from every one of the nations. But we know it's not the will of Hashem. How do we know it's not the will of Hashem? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in the Torah that a king is not allowed to marry more than 18 wives. So the minute you marry more than 18 wives, already you're doing something that's your logic, not Hashem's logic. So Hashem rebuked them on that. So as far as, uh, as, as, far as Shlomo HaMelech, he definitely married only Jews. He was a very righteous person. But because he married so many women, he fell for the trap of his own logic. And he nearly lost Olam Abba. The Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin says that the, uh, the Tanaim came to the Bet Din and they started evaluating the Din of Shlomo HaMelech and what he did. And they wanted to do a Psak Alacha in this world, which whatever is Psak Alacha in the Bet Din of Mata of this world, they judge in heaven. They wanted to judge Shlomo HaMelech lost his Olam Abba. That's what they want to say. They want to judge. Why? He went. Even though he kept Shabbat, kept Tara, kept it, kept it. Kept. Still, there's one law that he went against. He didn't do the will of Hashem when it came down to marrying a thousand wives and having a thousand horses, sending people to Egypt and so on. There's two little sins that he made. Little. In his, in his, uh, in our level, it's not even a sin. Who are we? But him, for him, it was like two things. They said, ah, he had too many horses. Hashem said, no, have horses. Why? Because if you have too many horses, you're going to go to Egypt. Shlomo Melech says, I'm never going to go to Egypt. I'm not going to go to Egypt. What happened? He had a lot of horses, but then he wanted more horses. So what happened? They went to go to the best horses. Where are the horses? Where are the best horses? In Egypt. So he fell for that one. And he also fell for the thousand wives. So the Chachamim say, we think based on the laws of the Torah, Shlomo Melech, no Lama. And they nearly made the Psak, 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 man, go ahead. Once they hit the, uh, the, uh, the, the table, it's finished. Everybody agrees, finished. Meaning, Shlomo Melech right now is sitting in Gan Eden, hanging out, Moshe Rabbeinu. If they make this Psak, Duma comes into Gan Eden, takes him out, Shlomo, Genom. Now, of course, everybody in Shemaim, they see what's going on in this world. Shlomo cannot come and defend himself. Who comes? David Amelech, the Neshama of David Amelech comes to the Bed Din. The Gemara says this. The Neshama of David Amelech comes to the Sanhedrin. And he starts begging them on all fours, please, don't send my son to Genom. Don't do this Psak. Said David, thank you, but Lord Bashamaimi, we don't uh, make laws based on somebody that came from Gan Eden. He says, yeah, but you're incorrect on this one. David, David, please, thank you. I, we understand Mashiach comes from you, but uh, thank you. 
We have our own conclusions. They nearly made the psak. Akadosh Baruch Hu obviously did not want this to happen, so he sent a uh, a bear, made a fire, into the bed. Dean, everybody got scared right away. Everybody ran away. Shlomo Melech stays in Ganeidin. But they nearly made it. Why? These two minor errors. Two minor errors. After that, they understood that their psak was incorrect. It's not from heaven. It's not uh, what Hashem wanted. And they let it be. But the point is, is that Shlomo Melech nearly lost his Olam Abba. So that's why the Gemara, I believe it's in Masichet Shabbat, last section, says that if you look at the end of the life of Shlomo Melech, it says that Hashem was not happy with some of his actions. The Gemara says it was better that Shlomo Melech was never a Melech and instead was the guy that was cleaning the bathrooms for 70 years and not have this verse written about him. You know what's cleaning the bathrooms? It's not like today. What does the guy cleaning the bathroom do? I mean, it's, the place is filthy. What is the really guy doing? All the guy does, flush the toilet, finish, you clean the bathroom. That's what you do. You go, you flush the toilet, put some sponges, and finish, clean the bathroom. That's why the guy's whistling all day. In those days, cleaning the bathroom, what cleaning the bathroom go means? Cleaning the bathroom means you have to go inside the ground and take the filth. Everybody, everybody's filth that it's accumulated over the last day, week, month, however often you cleaned it, take it out of the ground with your hands. And go carry it with you a few miles down the road, meaning you're not getting rid of it. You have to carry this filth with you for a few miles. Chachamim say in the Gemara, it was better that Shlomo HaMelech would do this all day, all night, for 70 years, and not have this verse written about him that Hashem was displeased with him. Even though Shlomo HaMelech was Tzadik Kodesh Kodeshim, Mashiach comes from him. Doesn't come from me, comes from him, Mashiach. But still, it was one thing, there was a little gum, there was a little scratch. It says that scratch is in a Tanakh. That scratch is in a Tanakh. That means that a, a kid learning Tanakh is going to learn this verse. So that's why Rabbi Tayyip Karim, Shlomo Amelech was Kodesh Kodeshim, but at the same token, made a mistake. That also shows the authenticity of our Torah where our Torah does not hide the mistakes of the greatest people in history. Even though in comparison to us it's not even a mistake, but still it highlights, in fact, the mistake of the greatest people in the world. Why? To show us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu judges fairly, judges equally everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're righteous, not righteous, you're big, you're small, you're male, you're female. He's the Dayan of Emit. He's the judge of Emit, regardless of who and what you are. Doesn't matter how many meets what you did. You did something wrong, I'll tell you you did something wrong. Did something right, I'll tell you you did something right. Next question. Chavod, Moshe. As it says in the Tanakh, Shlomo Amalek was the wisest, smartest person while history besides Moshe Rabbeinu. If he was so wise and smart, how did he, as you said, he knew, it says in the Torah, you can only have 18 wives. And he, through his rationality, he wanted to convert everybody into Judaism, every woman, into the whole nation is into Judaism. Yet, how did he get labeled the smartest man? If a person is smart, they're supposed to learn from their mistakes in a sort of way? Was it Gava? His mistakes after he did it he, he admitted that it was a mistake later on in his life he said that he made a mistake but while he was doing it he didn't see it as a mistake because he saw it as a mitzvah it's a mitzvah to bring peace it's a mitzvah to help people convert to Judaism it's a mitzvah to add more mitzvah to the world it's a mitzvah and he thought that if the way he rationalized it at least to my understanding is that if you were just marrying 18 Jewish women normally you know, that's allowed. If you're marrying 20, 25, 50, 100 Jewish women, then that's not allowed. Why? Because you already have 18. What's the point? But he rationalized that, no, I'm only marrying these extras 
because I want to make them Jewish, because I want to make more Jewish people, because I want to bring world peace, because I want to bring the Mashiach. Why do I want to bring the Mashiach? To sanctify Hashem's name to the highest level it's ever been. Meaning it's not for him and his desire to be with a thousand women. It's only for the sake of a Kadosh Baruch Hu he rationalizes, so it must be a mitzvah. But you have to understand that even a mitzvah, you have to do it the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it. And that was the mistake of Shlomo Melech. So even though he was wise, he was still human. He was still human. As far as his wisdom is concerned, to give you a small example of his wisdom, so we don't think that he's like us in any way, shape or form, uh, because the mistakes makes him seem like he's us. Because we figure that now that we know the story in hindsight, ah, I wouldn't even make this mistake. I wouldn't make it. Maybe I should be a Mashiach. Maybe I'm Shlomo Melech Bemet. Maybe I'm the Gilgul. So let me explain to you what Shlomo Melech is. Shlomo Melech. There's a midrash that talks talks about his throne. His throne. He built his throne. His throne had more sophisticated technology has more sophisticated technology than anything we have in the world today. Anything we have in the world today. People think because they have iPhones and iPad and i something, they think that we have sophisticated technology. If you read the Midrash that talks about the throne of Shlomo Melech, which by the way, Hashverosh tried taking, this throne had technology that's unbelievable. First and foremost, you were, he was the only one that was allowed to sit in it. Why? You had to have codes. There was a lion on one side, and there was a, a golden lion, and a golden eagle. Now, as soon as he came, there's no electricity in those days. There's no batteries. There's no, uh, you know, Siri. Right? But he goes over there. On the first step, before he takes the first step, he says a verse in the Torah. As soon as he says a verse in the Torah, the, uh, the eagle's wing comes golden eagle golden eagles not uh you know microprocessors golden eagle the eagle goes lifts his leg up goes to the next step continues saying verse for every step eventually he gets to the throne sits down as soon as he sits on the throne there was a golden dove not that they painted a real dove in gold like it was gold Golden dove flew and put and carrying his uh, his his uh, crown and put it on his head. Put it on his head. Now, what happens if you don't know the code? You don't know the verses. Well, that happened. Paro, Paro of that day after Shlomo Melech died. Paro tried taking the throne. He wanted to go on the throne, and he didn't know the verse. So he just said uh, Muhammad Ali. He said. So instead of the eagle lifting him, the lion took his arm, hit him in the back, broke his back. He was a paraplegic for the rest of his life. No one was able to sit in his throne. And this is from gold. Furthermore, Shlomo Amelech was the only one that knew where to find the seven different types of gold in the world. There are seven, Gemara says there are seven different types of gold in the world different shades and colors, but most importantly, they have different uh, 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 abilities. One of those golds, one of those golds that he had, was a gold that produces gold. Meaning, you take a bar of gold, you put it in a drawer, you come back the next day, there's two bars. You leave it in the drawer, the next day there's four bars. It gives birth to another bar, another bar, it continues expanding. Everybody's asking, where's this gold? Well, you know Rabbi Ruben? I know, I know, I'm just not telling you. That's where my millions come from. Anyway, he had this gold. He knew where to find it, and that's how he built an entire city of gold. The entire Bet HaMikdash was full of gold. When the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, all the goyim, they took the gold from the Bet HaMikdash. But they, when they brought all this gold from the Bet HaMikdash to the market, there was so much surplus extra gold in the world now that the price of gold collapsed all over the world. That's how much gold Shlomo HaMelech had. Because his gold continued producing gold but nobody knows where this gold is anymore. Except me. <laughs> but the point is Rabotai is that he had the understanding of where to get this, which part of the world. He also knew where to get the Shamir worm. 
a special type of worm that would uh, had radiation come out of it so he could build the Bet Mikdash without using metal. He would cut the stones. If you go to the Kotel Ma'aravi, the western wall, you see these stones are massive. They're huge stones, but they weren't cut by metal. Because you weren't allowed to build the Bet Mikdash with metal. Because metal is the sign of war. So how do you cut these huge giant stones? It was a special worm. It's called a Shamir worm. That radiation came out of it, and it would cut the stones. Only Shlomo Melech knew where to find this. He knew that uh, Ashmedai, the king of the demons, he knew it. He tra- he knew how to trap him, and he got him to bring it to him, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many things that Shlomo Melech was the only one in the world that knew. Uh, his, wi- his wisdom is, uh, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. I heard one huge Talmud Chacham one time say, it's in essence the closest we could as humans can get to God like that's that's how his wisdom is not like high IQ like 200 300 there's no IQ no IQ like like Einstein you know people think Einstein or or, or, or Newton Isaac Newton they think that uh, these people were really smart next to Shlomo Melech they were retarded that's that's the comparison that's the comparison. And so that's something that uh, you read. You read the Midrashim about Shlomo Melech. You see the things that he said, the things that he knew uh, were something unbelievable. But nonetheless, he still was human and made a human error uh, that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu judged him for. Next question. Um, so I was reading on a website that, that the Mashiach is going to be even wiser than Shlomo Melech. Um, is that true? And where, from where do we learn that? There is a uh, different uh, prophets that talk about uh, the Mashiach and different midrashim that talk about Mashiach and they say that the Mashiach is going to have half of his uh, neshama is going to come from Moshe Rabbeinu and half of his neshama is going to come from David HaMelech and he's going to have attributes that have, are surpassing any man before him with the exception of Moshe Rabbeinu because Moshe Rabbeinu is Isha Elohim he's the prophet of all prophets He's uh, the best of the best. No one will ever be like Moshe Rabbeinu, even in the, uh, even the Mashiach. But he will have certain things that nobody else had, which in one of them is intellect. He will be the smartest man that ever lived, even more than Shlomo Amelech. Because in essence, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to use him as, in essence, his uh, uh, representative, if you will, in this world. So this, uh, this uh, person... Is going to have wach He's going to have the uh, the uh, the uh, spirit of God in him, where Hashem is going to, you know, dictate to him what to say, what to do. He's going to have superhuman powers. He's going to be able to know all of your sins without even, uh, you know, without even looking at you. He's going to smell your sins, smell your yirat shemaim. He's going to be able to judge without a bedin. Uh, so there's going to be different uh, special powers that weren't given to any man before him. Uh, so that's that's where it comes from. Next question. Yes, Sutton. What was it? I forgot the question. Forgot the question. We'll remember it soon. Joshua has a question. I was I wasn't ready the question. You guys answer it. Moshe has a question. You go ahead. Ask the question. I heard about the Mashiach. Um, I heard that. Um, He's gonna have. He's gonna have to surpass every challenge of the world. That he's a person just like everybody else, and he doesn't know he's the Mashiach. Mm-hmm. So what's the question? The question is, how can a person go through every? How can a person go through every experience that everybody else had? So the Gemara says that Yeshua ben Levi asked Eliyahu and Avi, "Where's the Mashiach?" And the Yawan Avi said to him, he's at the gate of Rome. When? No, go see him. He's next to all the sick people there. So Yeshua ben Levi said, goes over there and he sees that there's a special person there. And uh, he's the Mashiach. Special Neshama. I don't know what he looked like exactly, but maybe he looked like you guys. But point is, is he was the Mashiach, what he looked like. So he says, it's written over there, that uh, he was full of bandages next to a bunch of other people that were full of, you know, that were injured. But while everybody else 
was taking off one of their bandages in order to replace it because of all the blood and so on to replace it they would take one of their bandages off you know clean the area and then put a new one on and then take another bandage off and clean it and put it on you know that's what happens when you you're injured from war and so on but the Mashiach the Mashiach would take off all of his bandages and then put all of his bandages back on meaning clean it so Yeshua ben Levi says well how come how come you're doing it that way where the normal way is the other way he says because I don't want I want to make sure that if HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells me to come right now then I'm not going to be late for a second I'm not going to be late for a second so I'm ready right away so I make sure that I have the bandages on all at the same time and so on so where are all these injuries coming from he says this uh, the, the injuries are coming from you know the uh, different sins that people make affect the Mashiach affect the Mashiach this is by the way one of the places where the Goim got their demented idea of their Yoshke dying for our sins the big difference is is that their, while our Mashiach is affected by our sins so much so that when anyone is gonna see Mashiach immediately they're gonna see what kind of injury they caused the Mashiach and they're gonna, it's gonna cause them embarrassment because imagine you have the king and he has a scratch on his face and it came from your uh, sin from 25 years ago so but the point is is that that's a sin you made but you did tshuva the the Christians on the other hand what are they saying they're saying that Yoshke died not for the sins that people made back then but sins they're gonna make in the future too meaning you're allowed to continue sinning it's the opposite of Judaism Judaism says you sin but you did tshuva it's fine but if you're going to continue sinning and in essence use that argument to continue sinning it's the opposite of Judaism the point is, is that every single day the Zohar Kadosh says Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov come to the Mashiach this is obviously all talking about a neshama it's not talking about a physical body because the, 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 as you said the person that's Mashiach that's in, in, in physical form does not know he's the Mashiach until Hashem tells him he's the Mashiach which at that point he will tell us so this is all in essence the neshama. The neshama of the Mashiach has been around since the beginning of time. So now Hashem is going to, uh, uh, has this neshama out there. And every day Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov come to the neshama of Mashiach and beg him, beg him to continue. Continue waiting. Continue letting Am Yisrael do tshuva. Every single day. Which, but that's in essence spiritually painful for him. Whatever that means. So this is more of the deeper talks, the deeper Kabbalah stuff. It talks about Mashiach. As I told you guys many, many times, it's all interesting when it comes to Mashiach, but it's usually not going to help anybody do tshuva. So let's try to move to a different subject that's going to help people do tshuva, make us better human beings, make us closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, whether, whether Mashiach has a mustache or a beard is not going to help anybody here. You know, whether Mashiach is uh, going to come... Uh, tomorrow or in two days from now or in 20 years from now it's not going to help anybody here either way we all have to do tshuva today today is when we have to do tshuva so let's try to talk about something else it's not that we don't know it's just simply that i want to be more uh, productive with our shiurim to help us to uh, get closer to hashem not to get us to become experts in the topic of mashiach Chavod, next question well, i actually wanted to ask one more mashiach question <laughs> Somebody has a non-Mashiach question. <laughs> Son has a non-Mashiach question. No, guys. Uh, Should I give it to him? Or? Not understanding the indication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was reading Silas Sharman and said that there's time for enjoyment in Gan Eden, but there's also time for regret. Ken. That's why you can gain so you know how that works. So, the, uh, if we run out of questions, I'll answer your Mashiach questions also, but I don't want to like not ask the other questions because we took up the time for Mashiach questions. I'm not disrespecting you or your questions, just that I want to focus on something that's going to help. Now, Gan Eden and Genom are very, very deep and important subject in Judaism. So much so that if you read the, um, the Shara Gmul, the, the Ramban, uh, the Ramban HaKadosh, he, uh, he writes on a uh, extensive writing on it in the beginning of Shara Gmul. And uh, he says that uh, uh, this, what the sages said, all the scary stuff is very much literal. 
there is a real fire in Gainom, and there's multiple types of fire, and there's uh, multiple types of uh, angels that have, you know, the uh, job of destroying and killing Neshamot, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same token, everything also is real when it comes to Ganedin. Ganedin, the reward. Now, Ganedin, he writes, is the opposite of Gainom. It's the opposite of Gainom. And we have multiple places that talk about uh, Gan Eden, uh, where we have in the Mishnah and Avot, the disciples of Bil'am, the wicked, go to Gehenom, but the disciples of Avram Avinu inherit Gan Eden. Uh, in our Tefillah, we mention also a, uh, another uh, Mishnah and Avot, where he says the, uh, the bold face, meaning the arrogant, are destined to gain home, but the shame face, the, the humble, are uh, destined for Gan Eden. Uh, whoever causes the multiple people to become righteous, meaning whoever does Kiruv, helps people become uh, Baalit Shuva, shall have no sin brought about through him. Uh, and so he should not go to Genom while his disciples go to Gan Eden. Meaning, if you help other people do Tshuva, Hashem will help you go to Gan Eden. And not make mistakes because he does not want your students to be in Gan Eden and you, Chas Shalom, in Genom. And so on and so forth. And lastly, he says in the, uh, he, he quotes the, uh, the uh, Midrash, Ve'ele Shmot Raba, that the sages said that whoever observes the Torah, Gan Eden lies before him, and whoever doesn't observe the Torah, Genom lies before him. So there is no secular person that is going to Gan Eden. You have to observe the Torah. You cannot be a Mechalel Shabbat in Gan Eden. It's not possible. It's not possible. There's no such thing. Even if you're a nice guy. Even if you suffered a lot. Like this uh, recent video by Manus the Menace. He, uh, he came out saying that uh you know that uh you know the the uh, uh everyone that suffered in europe and in, in the holocaust the old sadikim the old sadikim you know why because they suffered what source in the torah says that because you suffered you're a tzaddik what if you suffer but and you murdered a lot of people what if let's say for example hitler you know after he killed six million jews and millions and millions of other non-jews he got cancer and you know cancer is very painful you ever see cancer? It's genom in this world. So why, does that make him a tzaddik? <laughs> Makes him a tzaddik? Why, because he suffered? Well, where, is, where does this come from? It's complete nonsense. Suffering does not make you a tzaddik. It does not make you a tzaddik. It softens the neshama, and it could potentially open up your neshama to the emet, but it does not make you a tzaddik by default. So, the Ramban writes, if you observe the Torah, Gan Eden lies before you. Meaning you're going to go to Gan Eden. For observing the Torah, you're going to Gan Eden. If you don't observe the Torah, you're going to gain Om. So how come Gan Eden also has a certain amount of, uh, let's say, suffering, if you will, like, like uh, uh, Sutton said, is that people understand when these Neshamot go to Gan Eden, they get to see different parts of Gan Eden, not just their own. And they see what the potential is if they would have done one more mitzvah. One more mitzvah. And one of the stories I remember, I heard from Rav Nisim again, Allah Shalom. He says, Rav Chaim Ivolozhin, Allah Shalom, he was a Kodesh Kodeshim, and I believe uh, he died before his wife. And uh, one day his wife has a dream, and a Malach says to her, You want to see Gan Eden? You want to see your husband in Gan Eden? She says, Yes. So they bring her to Gan Eden. And they bring her to all these beautiful places with trees and flowers and mountains. Beautiful, something out of this world. She goes, where is he? He goes, oh, it's, keep going, keep going. And they keep going, more beautiful things, more, more, more. Where is he? Where is he? More, more. And they keep going and going and going. This is all part of him. This is all part of his Gan Eden. Of your husband's Gan Eden. But where is he? Oh, he's all the way in the end. This guy goes, see him? She goes, no, no, this is as far as you can go. This is as far as you can go. She said, why? I was his wife. I helped him learn Torah. Said, but you didn't work on yourself also. You're supposed to help him go and do mitzvah, do Torah, do everything else. You also was supposed to work on yourself. So she woke up, started hysterical crying, and did tshuva. And she got to his level. Why? In Shamaim, they know that she has the potential to be righteous and be next to her husband forever. But she didn't work hard enough, so they wanted to give her a message. We want you to be with your husband. 
We want you to be with your husband. We don't want you to miss out. Why? Because if you miss out, you go to Gan Eden, a different one. You're not going to see him. Why? Because he's higher. So you have to work on yourself. You can't just, uh, you know, be on neutral because your husband is a tzaddik. You can't be on neutral because your wife is a tzaddikah. Like sometimes guys tell me, them, listen, why don't you come to the shul? No, Rabbi, listen, I work, I do this. I, you know, I give tzedakah. I said, okay, tzedakah, thank you very much, tzedakah. But uh, you have to learn Torah also. Rabbi, listen, my wife is such a tzedakah, I think it's okay, everything's okay. Oh, my grandfather is a big rabbi. My grandfather used the word, okay, your grandfather and your wife, they're both going to go to Gan Eden. What about you, though? What, you going to go to Gan Eden just by default? We're going to hold on to their foot? What do you think? There's no, you can't get the Gan Eden by. So, when you're finally Bezat Hashem and Gan Eden, you also see certain things that you could have done. Different potentials. Different things that you could have gotten for it. That extra mitzvah, putting on tzitzit, your Gan Eden could have been a world apart. World apart. You start seeing the value of mitzvot, where I gave you guys an illustration a few weeks back. If you take all the good that you have had in your life and you put it in a box and then you take all the good not the bad in the life of a person but all the people that are in the world let's say they live a hundred years on the average right out of the hundred years there's maybe I don't know maybe five ten years of good twenty years of good and really five years but let's say it's twenty years of good out of a hundred years okay you eliminate the eighty years of bad you just take the good you take the good of every single person that ever lived and you put it all in that same box. All that good that ever existed for any human being is not even enough to be a down payment for the good that you will get for any mitzvah in the Torah. You put on tzitzit, every second is a mitzvah. All the good that everybody ever had in the world is not enough to be one second of putting on a tzitzit. So that means, Rabotai, that if somebody says, okay, so you know what? Since it's so much, who needs so much? Right? It's so much. So, so what am I going to do? I'll put on tzitzit at home. I'll put on tzitzit for like half a day. I'll put kisu on at home. I'll put, I'll put on, uh, you know, I'm going to read like one verse every day. Why could? So what's good? Might as well, right? What happens? Person gets, let's say, they, they go up to Shemaim and they give him this ganed and it's like, it's much greater than this world, obviously. But when they see what they would have gotten had they wore the tzitzit all the time, when they see what they would have gotten, had they wore the kisui rosh all the time, if they learned more Torah, if they did more mitzvot, they feel bad about it. Why? They see what the potential they miss for nothing. For nothing. So that's why a person is not doesn't want to do that. He wants to leave this world where he or she has tried their best. They tried their best. Failed a little bit, succeeded a lot a bit. Point being, you tried your best. That's what you want to leave this world. You want to leave this world pretty much where the wheels are falling off because you tried so hard. So to get to Gan Eden requires a lot of effort. A lot of effort. There are other midrashim, other things that are said about the whole Gan Eden Genom's issues, but you get one of the points at least. One of the points is, is what I just said. Next question. Uh, if you get, end up in different levels. Hold on, hold on. Microphone, microphone. If you end up in uh, different, different levels in Shemaim, do you. Uh, is, is there some, some kind of connection or, or state, state of awareness, awareness that, even, let's say you and your wife came in different levels, are you still aware and connected to each other somehow, or is it complete different? So, if the uh, wife and the husband are connected properly in this world, they have Kedusha at home. They have Torah at home, they're together, they'll be together permanently. That's the way it's supposed to be. <coughs> but if not, if they go to different levels where he is much more righteous than her or she's much more righteous than him, then they will have a separation forever. Because you cannot do tshuva in shamaim. But there is an awareness of, uh, of each other. So uh, there is a... Uh, I believe it's in the Zohar or in the Midrash. Uh, there is a uh, place where Chachamim discuss certain things that happen in Gan Eden. Like for example, that uh, every uh, day or every so often, uh, the Avram goes to visit uh, his, uh, his wife. You know, Sarah Imenu. And, and because there's a Gan Eden for males, a Gan Eden for females. 
It's not uh, together. So there's a uh, separation also over there. But he goes to his wife at certain times. She goes to him at certain times. Even uh, Batya Bat Paro. Batya Bat Paro is the only one that's allowed to go to the visit the Gan Eden of Moshe Rabbeinu. She goes to visit him every day. Uh, so there is a interesting things going on over there. For us in this world, we don't really understand what does it mean visit. Why would they visit? Why don't they just hang out? The ish, the things that they do in Gan Eden are, are really uh, uh, lost to us because we don't understand the concept of good really. Uh, but nonetheless, yes, if a, a person is in uh, in Gan Eden, they're very very much aware of what's going on over there, and they're also aware of uh, things that are going on here. They're still uh, connected to certain people uh, that are here. That's how we know, for example, there are several, quite a few stories of different people that were uh, in danger uh, and uh, they got uh, sometimes a near-death experience and uh, they were given another chance because that their uh, grandfather that was a major tzaddik was aware of this issue and uh, came to help them. Or there's, for example, a uh, very famous story in the book of the Chazonish. Chazonish, Allah Shalom, has a sefer that talks about different things that happened in this time. Uh, and uh, there was a, uh, uh, there was a uh, new couple, new, newlywed couple, and uh, the, uh, the wife came from a uh, religious family, and the guy was religious, and, but the wife, her father, was a businessman. And uh, the uh, father told the, uh, the, the, the husband, listen, you can continue learning after marriage for another five years, and I'll pay for it. But after five years, you have to, you have to start working a little bit. So they agreed. They agreed. Good shiduch, good family, everything is good. So he was learning for five years. Every day, all day, he's learning. And... Uh, after five years, the father came to him and said, Listen, okay, Chazaku Baruch, that you learned for the last five years, but uh, what about work? He said, Listen, I want to learn Torah. You know, there's plenty of work. I want to learn Torah and we'll figure it out. He goes, Listen, why don't you do this? Why don't you at least do some, uh, come, you know, an hour a day, do some accounting for us. Do, some, do the numbers for the business. An hour a day. Why? I don't, I don't have to pay for your... Uh, you and your wife, my daughter, for the rest of your life. You work for an hour a day. And the wife says to uh, the husband, yeah, why not? You know, he's right. Why, he's going to pay for us forever? Work for an hour a day and learn the rest of the day. So that's what he did. He started working. And the wife continued encouraging him to work more. No, come on, two hours a day. No, three hours a day. Four hours. Why? Because every time he worked, he make more money. And little by little, there was more money. Nicer house. Nicer stuff, nicer chandelier, nicer chairs, nicer table, nicer, nicer, nicer. Before you know it, he stopped learning altogether. Stopped completely learning. On the day that he stopped learning altogether, a dibuk came into his wife. A dibuk is a neshama of somebody that's being judged in kafakela. A person that's not in Gan Eden or in Genom. They're roaming outer space. And sometimes they're permitted to go and into other people. Now when there's two neshamot in one body, it's mayhem. If you read the uh, book by Rabbi Yudaftaya, for example, which was translated to English, he talks about all the dibukim that he dealt with in his life of different people that he would help them because they had a dibuk in them and he would take it out which requires the uh, holy names and so on. But the point is, is that this wife had a dibu going to her. She starts saying all types of crazy stuff. A different voice comes out of her. It doesn't sound like her voice. Uh, all types of strange things. Started acting crazy, doing crazy things. So the rabbis came and they tied down the woman so she doesn't continue going crazy. And they started talking to the Kubalim. They started talking to the, to the, the Dibuk. Says, who are you? And Dibuk answered, I, am a, I was an orphan that uh, didn't know 
what to do. They know Torah, they know mitzvot. So, are you okay? Okay. Didn't know Torah, didn't know mitzvot, so uh, I didn't uh, do anything good in life, and I was a very promiscuous woman. But when I went up to Shammai, they said, listen, we can't put you in Gainom because you didn't know anything. But we can't put you in Ganedi because you didn't do anything good either. So we'll leave you in Kavakela in outer space until you pay the bill for all these bad things that you did because you still had a brain that you should have discovered and figured out what's the purpose of life. You never did. So you have to go to Kavakela. So then they asked the Dibuk, okay, so who gave you permission to go into this woman? She goes, it's not that they gave you permission. Is that the grandparents, the grandparents of the husband and her grandparents, her grandfather, which were both big tzaddikim, her grandfather and his grandfather were big tzaddikim. They came from Gan Eden, they came to me because they saw me roaming around town. They said, listen, you do us a favor. Go into our granddaughter over here. Go into my, uh, my, uh, my daughter-in-law. Go into her. Why? Because she stopped her husband from learning Torah. So go into her, tortures her, torture her as much as possible until she says, I'm sorry, and she makes a swear that she's going to send her husband to go learn Torah full time. This is written in the, in the book of the Chazonish. It's something that happened. Of course, everybody said, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, everybody's sorry. Once you realize what's happening, everybody's sorry. I'm sorry, the grandfather of Tzadik came and got involved in this issue. He took the Avrech and he ruined him, turned him into a businessman. They came to us and said, oh, I'm sorry, he's going to go full time, 25 hours a day, not 24. We're going to invent a new hour for him. Go, go back to Kola, go back, learn all day, all night, no problem. And then the Dibuk left. They were, they were allowed to take out the Dibuk. Now, why is this such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal? Why would a grandfather that's a tzaddik, a grandfather that's a Ish Kodesh, get involved with his grandson or great, great, great grandson 20 generations later? Why would he get involved? Because they are also aware of the capability of the Neshama that's here. Meaning, what is expected of the neshama in this world? Which means, your neshama has certain capabilities and certain expectations from Hashem. You may not be aware of them. You may not even think you're able to do it. Because if you will tell a guy that just started keeping Shabbat six months ago, you're going to be the next biggest rabbi in the world. You're going to know the entire Shas by heart. You're going to complete it every two months. You're going to give shirim five, five times a week. You're going to have a kolel with a thousand avrechim. The guy's going to say, what are you talking about? I don't even know the chot Shabbat. I just started keeping it a few months ago. I'm on book number one out of 30. What are you talking about? You're not going to think, what are you talking about? This is not, this is not me. It's no, no way. Because you're thinking based on your today knowledge. Based on your today ability. But in Shemaim, they understand the real potential of your neshama. Which means... That this woman, when she sent her husband to business in Shemaim, they saw what she was doing. She was simply murdering his neshama. And if, let's say for example, that neshama had the ability to be the next Rabbi Akiva Eagle, which was a Gdola Do a couple of hundred years ago, the next Rav Ovadia, the next Rav Wasserman, the next Chavetz Chaim, the next Stipler Gaon, the next Vilna Gaon, next one of these things. That's the ability that this Neshama had. It had all the tools to be the next big one. And you send him to go work. You send him to be the next big businessman. You go up to Shemaim, the wife goes up to Shemaim. She thinks she's a tzaddikah. Why? Because she kept Shabbat. And she kept Tarad Mishbacha. And her husband donated a million dollars every year to, to Kolos. Right? In Shemaim, they say, you are a murderer of Rabbi Akiva Eagle. You, you lady, murdered Rabbi Vadya. You murdered the Gaumi Vilna. What are you talking about? I don't even know Gaumi Vilna. No, no, no. Your husband was supposed to be the next Gaumi Vilna. But every time you went to the Kolo, you called him every five minutes. No, no, you're coming home? I want to go eat dinner. No, you're coming? I want to go out. 
No, you're coming. You know, no, no, you bothered him. You didn't let him learn. Eventually, he lost the uh, ability to learn. He stopped learning. You murdered him. So sometimes a person has the merits of his forefathers with a tzaddikim and they get involved before it's too late. And we know that many, many times. So that's also how we know, one of the ways we know, and the Gemara also discusses it that the Neshamot of Shemaim are aware of things that are happening in this world, but we see it in real life. We see it in books, we see it in uh, things that have happened, things that we've seen, things that are still happening today, where there are certain Neshamot that are very much aware of the certain people that are connected to them still in this world. Um, and uh, they also have a different type of knowledge like us, uh, to us, uh, where they're aware simultaneously of what's happening there and what's happening here at the same time, where we, ha- we do not have that ability. And the Shema has the ability to know information simultaneously in multiple places. It's not limited. One of the ways that uh, we saw it as examples in real life is when you hear near-death experiences, somebody died, let's say, in a uh, car accident of some kind, Shem Yachem, and came back to life. When they come back to life, they tell people, listen, I did this, I did that, and they tell them all types of stories, and a lot of times people say, okay, you know, you're still a little woozy from the fall. Because, no, no, you don't understand, I'm telling you the truth. I know what's happening. What's happening? It says, the doctor such and such was the one that was uh, doing the surgery on me. And they never saw the doctor. But they know the name. How do they know the name? It says, and the doctor has a mustache. How? You were sleeping. You were in a coma. How did you know the mustache? You died. On top of that, there are sneakers somebody forgot on the roof of the building. Now, even if you somehow finagled somebody to tell you who the doctor is, how do you know there's sneakers on the top of the roof? And there's an accident on I-95, three miles from here. How do you know about the accident? It just happened two minutes ago. Me, the Neshamot, go to different places and they're able to see different things. They don't have a limitation. They know this simultaneously. Simultaneously. There's a uh, very, very interesting movie that uh, Rav Mizrahi, Rav Yosef Mizrahi, Sheikh Yeh, uh, he made. It's called Life After Death. And it shows different things about different examples, different uh, uh, clips of di- different people that died and came back to life and their stories. Uh, it's a couple of hours, highly recommended. Uh, but there's also many, many other uh, 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 experts in this field that uh, see there's a uh, the ability of the neshama, the ability of the soul, is nothing like the limitations of the body. So it's not just written in our books from 2,000 years ago, it's also people that deal with it uh, know that there's a uh, something that we would consider superhuman that they have as a uh, standard last question last question you could be your Mashiach question if nobody else has questions This rabbi told me that uh, the Mashiach is not even going to receive prophecy until the third uh, Bet Amikdash is rebuilt. In that case, how is he going to know what to do before that? Mashiach is not going to receive prophecy until the third Bet Amikdash is going to be built? Uh, Yeah. What does he mean he's not going to get prophecy? So what is he going to do? Just hang out? Go to work? I don't understand. Uh, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Uh, I don't know know what, uh, what context this rabbi was telling you this uh, whether he was telling you about what's going to happen in the future or not I, i'd say uh, i would have to hear it uh from him or perhaps uh see what book he quoted to read the uh the context that he's referring to it's like um, there is a famous gemara where resh lakish says there is a uh, no genom there's no genom in the future no gain in the future. But then there's another Gemara that Resh Lakish, same Resh Lakish, gives you details, Masech Psachim, gives you details of the fire of Genom. Wait a minute. You just said one hand, there's no Genom in the future. And another one, you told us the details of Genom. So is there Genom or no Genom? Right? It's confusing. So the Ramban writes in, in, in a uh, Shara Gmul, detailed analysis of what is he referring to surely Resh Lakish knows and believes that there is a Genom 
But when he said the statement that there's no genome in the future, he didn't say that there's no genome in the world. He was referring to the future when the Mashiach comes in this world for certain types of people, certain types of time. It was a specific type of statement catered to a specific type of time. It's not genome in general. But unless you read the entire Gemara and you read the commentaries by the Chachamim, you think that there is a uh, contradiction here. Why? Because on one hand he says there's no genome in the future. On the other hand he's telling you the details of genome. But then you have to understand, he's not saying there's no genome in the world. He's saying in the future. What's the future? When you mention the future, you're mentioning times of Mashiach. You're mentioning times of Mashiach. You're not mentioning eternity. You're not mentioning the next world and so on and so forth. So it's very, very important when we read the, the statements of the Chachamim that we not only analyze what was written before it and what's written bef- uh, after it, but we also analyze how it's written, what your words are being used, and what the Chachamim commented on this specific thing. Because without it, we're simply Christians. That's how Christians make their mistake of idol worshipping. What do they do? They read the Chumash and the Tanakh without Jewish commentary. They read it with their own logic. Whatever they read and they understand literally is what they think happened. And that's a problem. Why? Because you're never going to understand anything in the Torah that way. You're always going to get to a mistake. Always. Without an without exception. But that's what they do. They read things without commentary. And that's why, for example, every Christian that's a religious Christian, that's a missionary, he's always going to mention to you Isaiah 53. Why? Because in Isaiah 53, it says the word suffering servant. So their pastors and, and priests told them that the suffering servant surely means Yoshke. Even though Yoshke was not born for many, many years and so on and so forth. But what's the problem with this? What's the problem with this? Is that we do not get to a conclusion based on just what the sentence itself says literally. We get to a conclusion by analyzing the world around that sentence. What happened before? What happened after? What's the body of the sentence? You're never going to just simply read the, the headline in a newspaper, Le'avdil, and assume that you understand everything that happened in this event that's a, a three-page article. The headline is, in essence, giving you some type of tease to read the rest of the article. It's not telling you what really happened. It's not really telling you what's happened. Or else everything would just be, you know, headlines. So, needless to say, the Torah is not telling you the entire Torah in one verse. But when you read it that way, you become a Christian. You become a fool. Why? Because in essence, you're saying, oh, it says suffering servant. It appeals to me that this suffering servant would be the Yoshke guy because I'm looking for him in the Torah and I can't find him. So let's just say this is him. Let's just say that because I can't find him anywhere else. So I can't find him in a shoebox. I can't find him in Gan Eden. I can't find him among the Tzadikim. I can't find him in the Beknesset. I haven't looked in Gainom yet, but before that... Where can I find him? Ah, ah, suffering servant. But actually, if you look at the Christian writings, the Christian sages, the Christian sages say that uh, that Yoshke is in Genom. He went to Genom. But somebody, you know, got pulled out somehow. I, I mean, how's God going to Genom? I don't know. But anyway, point is, Abutai, if you're a Jew, you don't read this way. How do you read? You read not only Isaiah 53, you read Isaiah 52, 51, 50, 49. 48, 47, 46, 45, all the way to 1, and also 54, 55, 56, all the way to the end, 66, I think. So you read all of Isaiah, and if you read all of Isaiah, you have no doubt in your mind that the suffering servant is Am Israel. Why? Because it says, it says the suffering servant, literally it says it. Suffering servant is Am Yisrael. But if you're only going to read that one verse and you're going to listen to the teachings of your pastor and priest that are biased, then you're going to simply be mistaken. So when we learn Torah, we cannot learn the entire Torah from one verse. We cannot teach it from one verse. We have to simply understand the whole body around it. That's also part of the reason why Chachamim have to try to be very, very detailed with their answers and give you a lot more information than you asked for. Because you have to under- truly understand an answer, you have to know everything that comes with it and what it, what it entails and what it affects. To just tell you, yes, no, I can do that also. But that wouldn't help you in life. 
to give you a whole body around it, that's going to give you a solid answer you can work with and build upon. That's generally what Chachamim would do when they would be asked questions and they would write their answers in Sfarim, what we asked, they'd give you a whole body of answer and not just yes or no. Any fool can tell you yes or no, but that's not going to help you. So, point being is that I don't understand the question of, you know, the Mashiach not having prophecy. Like, if that's a question, Mashiach not having prophecy until the Bet HaMikdash, I don't understand in what context he's asking, he's saying that, or what context you're asking that. Generally speaking, we do know that the only uh, uh, certainty that we have about the Mashiach is that, number one, he will come, and two, we will know exactly What's going to happen at the time of Mashiach? Only when he comes. Only when he comes. That's what the Rambam says. We're only going to know everything that is said about Mashiach, as far as what will be once he comes, are possibilities. The, all the different types of possibilities. There's possibilities like this, there's possibility like that, there's possibility like this, and that. Not all of them necessarily need to happen. And we're not even limited to those things happening. Point being is that we will only know, the Rambam says, once the Mashiach comes, and therefore that's part of the reason of why we should not delve too much into the study of Mashiach and what would happen, because what ends up happening is that when people focus too much about Mashiach, number one, that means that they're wasting their Torah time that's supposed to help them in this world, on learning on, about something that is not going to help them at all. Learning about Mashiach is not going to make you a more humble person. Learning about Mashiach is not going to make you a more generous person. Learning about Mashiach is not going to help you become more uh, anything that's, that's positive. It's just more knowledge. It's not going to help you, uh, you know, all of a sudden study more Torah. Because you're spending your Torah time learning about Mashiach. So it's not going to help you become a better husband, a better wife, a better Jew. It's not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. So you're wasting that Torah time on learning about something that's not going to help you. And two, people become obsessive over it. Obsessive over it where they simply turn it into uh, some, uh, some type of idolatry. Hence, to what, look what's happening with Christianity, and what's been happening with Christianity. All of their attention went to one specific human being, and in essence, they're considered idol worshippers now. Uh, because they're all their focus has become about this one person to the extent where they conjure up the, the nonsense that this human being really is part of God. So that's what I... It didn't start that way. It didn't start that way. When Yoshke was walking around, you know, the people, no one thought he was God. No one thought he was God when he was walking around and uh, you know making all types of sins no one thought he was God but after people idolized him that's what happens you ask the average Christian they'll tell you that he's God even though many Christians says no no I don't believe he's God I believe he's this I believe you're never gonna believe you have two Christians have the same faith they all believe something else no one even you know believes in the, in the New Testament as it's written everybody's got their own uh, their own version of it which shows that their own neshama is rejecting it. Their own soul is rejecting it because it's complete nonsense. You don't believe the book. So what do you believe? You believe something that's in your head. So it's complete nonsense. But the point being is, when people put everything into one person, it's not good. That's also what's happening with, with, with Jews. When Jews put all of the attention to one rabbi, that's what the Gaul Mivina said. The Gaul Mivina was very scared of Hasidut because they were giving too much power to the rabbi. And he says, this is idolatry. Even though not everybody agreed with the Gomi Vina at the time, today we see that he was very much right. He was very much right to a certain extent, where you see today, many people that consider themselves Chabad Hasidim, not obviously all of them, and uh, uh, Baruch Hashem, there's uh, also many good ones that are not uh, uh, crazy, but many Chabadniks, or people that call themselves Chabadniks, have turned the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, into a God. They outright say he's God. Meaning it's no different than Christianity. But they keep Shabbat. And they keep Kashrut. And uh, they, they have Yeshivot. But they believe that the Rebbe is God. And the same thing happens to other things, other people, where they turn these uh, people into God. This is part of the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu 
did not let us know where Moshe Rabbeinu is buried. Because he was the closest person to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he did not want anyone to uh, tarnish that by going to the grave and starting to pray at the grave as if uh, they're praying to uh, Moshe, like people do at the Lubavitcher Rebbe's uh, grave or other tzaddikim's graves. People are praying to the tzaddikim. This is idolatry. So it's never good for anyone, Jew or non-Jew, to focus too much on a specific tzaddik or a specific person. You should have emunat chachamim, you should learn what they said, but all of that is, in essence, in order to connect to the one and only God of Israel. You know, you must have emunat chachamim, but not because the chacham is God, but rather because he has information about God that you need. He has dedicated his life to learn about God, and you can benefit from it. Not that he has any power per se. He's, in essence, someone that dedicated a lot more time and effort to learn about HaKadosh Baruch Hu and His Torah. And you can benefit from that. You can benefit from that work. Next question. Yes, Rabbi, the, um, both in Parashah Yitro and Parashah Bechutai, there's um, a commentary, commentary that, that uh, Hashem, Hashem visits the sins of the, of the children of third and fourth generations so first question is, what is what does uh, Hashem mean by this? And also, what are you know some of the more deeper sins that he would have to get involved in this way? And also, um, if let's say, if uh, if a Jewish father ha or whoever a Jew, a Jew has a uh, intermarriage with a non-Jew, and then has uh, uh, the children are not are not theirs basically. Um, so would would that still be included in that? In that uh, effect. Of you stayed quiet for two hours, and now you ask an eighteen-part question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, section one A of the answer, and then we'll finish next year. Uh, <laughs> good question. Question is, what is, what does it mean in the Torah when Hashem says that He'll visit the sins of the father on the grandkid on, on the kids, three, four generations? Doesn't it say in other places that uh, the son is not going to suffer for the sins of the uh, father? So is there a contradiction here? That's section A. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that if the father is a sinner, let's say for example, the, uh, the father is a gambler, the father is a thief, the father is an uh, atheist, now, the father is obviously a sinner, right? Now, the son has his own brain. Now, although the son is influenced by the father to a certain extent, he lives in the father's house. He gets influenced by the father. At some point, the kid starts using his own brain to make his own decisions. He doesn't only uh, live under his father's roof for the rest of his life. At some point, he starts making his own decisions that suit his own needs and fit his own agenda, even if they contradict what the father taught him and even if they contradict what the father says is good. So, Torah says that if the son uses his own brain when eventually he grows up and decides that he's going to continue the sins of his father, Meaning, he saw his father a gambler. He saw his father as a thief. He saw his father Michal Shabbat. He saw his father make all types of sin with women that are not his wife. And the son continues these sins, meaning he learns to be promiscuous from his father. He learns to be a rasha from his father. Then the son gets punished, not only for his own sin, but also for his father's sin too. It gets double whammy. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed you your father's a sinner not for you to learn to do it but to learn not to do it because you see that it's not good no one looks at a sinner and says wow he has a great life when you really understand the life of a sinner you see that this guy at the end is not going to win this girl in the end is not going to win he's not sending you to see the sinner and say ah you know go learn be a murderer from him you know it's not good 
You see it. You have a brain. You have your own brain. You know it's not good, but you decide to do it because you have desires. You get punished double because Hashem gave you an opportunity not to learn from Him to do it, but to learn not to do it because you're seeing the downside of drugs, the downside of promiscuity, the downside of gambling, and so on and so forth. Oh, you saw it and you still chose to ignore it, you get double whammy. On the other hand, if a person does not repeat the sins of the father, does not repeat the sins of the father, then he does not get punished for the sins of the father. Why? The father made his own sins, he gets his own punishment. You didn't follow what your father did, you did good things. Chazaku Baruch, no one's going to hold it against you that your father's paro. No one's going to hold it against you that your father's Esav. Why? In Shemayim, they say, look, this tzaddik. No one's going to say, this tzaddik, the, uh, you know, but his father's Rasha. No, no, no. No one's going to hold it against you. You're tzaddik, tzaddik tiye. That's it. It's good. No one's holding it against you where your parent is, who your father is. Who, none of that's the matter. So that's what it means over there. Now, if a Jewish guy has kids with a non-Jewish woman, I believe this is the second part of your question. If a Jewish guy has kids with a non-Jewish woman, as I said before, those kids are not considered his kids. But he has a different problem. What's his problem? His problem is that his sin continues to grow every day they're alive. Why? There is product. He, in essence, was part of the manufacturing process. So how could he do tshuva for it? How could he do tshuva for it? He's not allowed to kill them, chas v'shalom. How could he do tshuva for it? If the kids convert, that helps their father's tshuva. Why? Because they're no longer a sin. They're no longer a, uh, a bad product. They're, they're, they're now perfect. They're perfect. This is also part of the reason of why sometimes you're going to see, many times, not just sometimes, I've seen myself, where the products of intermarriage a Jewish guy that had non-Jewish kids, even though the Jewish uh, father has nothing to do with Judaism, many times, I've seen this dozens of times, the kids suddenly get the urge to convert to Judaism, suddenly get the urge to learn Torah, suddenly get the urge to be uh, tzadikim gmurim, tzadikot. So a few women like this, quite a few guys like this, where even though their parents were completely against the Torah, they hated it, but the kids love it. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives those, uh, those neshamot an opportunity. An opportunity to do tshuva. And doesn't put them in a way where they can't do tshuva. So even the neshamot that they bring to the world uh, have a uh, certain way to fix. But it's not all guaranteed. It's not like they all convert. But nonetheless, it, it does happen. Uh, it happens quite frequently. Uh, and, uh, but it's a problem. It's a problem for the father uh, because he literally needs the kids in order for his tshuva to be complete. He needs the kids to, to convert. And if the father is a uh, smart, he'll help them. If he stays wicked, he'll get in their way. Uh, but point being is that uh, this is like the test of the, or the tshuva. Like I mentioned to you guys of a guy that was with a non-Jewish girl, and the ultimate step is if she converts to Judaism, because that's in essence, he's with the same girl at the same time, but this time it's allowed. So in this case, it's the same kid, but this time he's a Jew. Uh, uh, you know, a Jewish girl, a Jewish guy, whatever it is. So point is, is that uh, when people convert, they also uh, help their parents. Help their parents because uh, they, uh, it could be potentially their, reason, their fault that they're uh, this way. Uh, and uh, sometimes even if the parents are not Jewish, those kids a, uh, bring marriage to the parents because their mitzvot are worth very, very uh, significant amount that could help their non-Jewish parents. Help the non-Jewish parents because in essence they still owe them the uh, gratitude. Owe them gratitude for bringing them into the world. If to, you don't, uh, the, uh, a, Jewish, a kid that converts to Judaism or a guy that converts to Judaism, or a girl that converts to Judaism, and her parents are not Jewish, her biological parents are not Jewish, she has no mitzvah of kibud avayim. Why? Because they're not her parents. But she still has to respect her parents anyway. Why? As a show of gratitude. Akaratatov. So it's not a mitzvah of kibud avayim, because they're not really your parents. 
but you still have to honor your parents and to do kibbutz avayim. Why? Because they brought you to the world, they supported you, they helped you in all types of ways, and so on and so forth. And you're still obligated to do it. But the point is, is that it's not the same mitzvah. It's a different mitzvah. It's a different mitzvah. And that's again all under the assumption that these parents, these biological parents, are not anti Torah and are not trying to get in the way of your conversion or your Jewish life, and uh, you know, and, and such. Anything else? Oh, you know, he didn't ask any questions. Chavod, give him the mic. We're almost done. Last, I already said last question three questions ago, but Ari didn't. He was staying quiet the whole day. He was on strike for two hours. He was doing Tani Dibu. What are the rules of inviting guests uh, relating to Avram and Sarah? By rules, um, let me clarify. Um, if you have a, if you want to invite a guest to your home, what are the limitations if that if that guest can be can be invited to the home? Let's say uh, there's someone living in the house who objects to this invitation. Um, what are the rules regarding that? And um, in these days, uh, tough times, uh, sometimes there are children living in the home where they're not children anymore. Can they dictate to the parent who can and cannot visit the home for Shabbat, for example? of uh, guests uh, is there limitations to inviting guests and are kids allowed to tell their parents what to do with their house you should make the next question a little longer uh, it wasn't long enough um, okay limitation of uh, guests uh, obviously a person needs to choose wisely who they uh, bring to their house um, you know as, as far as if this person is coming to your house because he has no place else to go, he has no place else to eat, and you want to help him, as long as it does not disturb anybody else in the house. Meaning, if you're married, and your wife says you're not allowed to bring these people to the house, you must listen to her. Why? Because your marriage is superior to the mitzvah of guests. But if your wife is on board and she says, okay, bring the guests, no problem, then, uh, okay, you can bring this guest. Question is, what's the point of bringing the guests? Are you just going to feed him? Or are you going to actually try to help this person get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like Avraham Avinu tried? Uh, so when Avraham Avinu would feed people, at the end of the dinner, you tell them, listen, you have two choices. You could either bless Hashem, thank Hashem for the food that He gave, or you could pay me for the food. Which one do you want? And also, in order to enter the house of Avraham Avinu, they uh, would be tested to see if they were idolaters and he would convert them to Judaism. If they were considered, uh, they stayed idolaters, they weren't allowed in. Uh, the way he would do it is by uh, seeing if they would, uh, uh, you know, clean their feet before they came to the house because the idol worshippers in those days were a certain type of Arab idol worshippers that would worship the sand on their feet. Uh, all idol worship is, is strange, not just this one. Point being is that if, that's why he washed the feet of the angels that came to him uh, to see if they would allow him. If they didn't allow him, he would know they were idol worshippers. Point being, Abutai, is that his goal of inviting guests wasn't to feed them. His goal of inviting guests is to do kiruv, to help people get closer to Hashem. So if you have the ability to bring people closer to Hashem because of the Torah learning that you're doing and uh, knowledge that you're able to portray to people, and you want to bring people closer to Hashem by inviting them to your house for Shabbat and so on, so long as your spouse agrees, perfect. Now what if you have a uh, roommate? You have a roommate. Now, if this guest is going to be at a place where the roommate is, meaning it's, let's say, if your house is uh, equal to both of you, you both allowed everywhere in the house, that means that the roommate has to agree that you're going to invite this guest. You can't just invite whoever you want to this house. Why? Because he owns this part. You can't just have somebody roaming around in his part of the house. So you have to have him agree just like you would have to have your wife or your husband agree. Uh, but if, let's say, the, the, the house is split up into two where you have your room, he has your, uh, his room, and that's it. 
you want to bring this guest into your into your room no problem it doesn't violate the other guy but the point being is that it's never good to invite people when you're uh, uh, someone that's living with you is going to be bothered with it second thing is in regards to um, what was the limitations what was the second part B of, of question one um, you even forgot children uh, taking over uh, no that was part C what was part B uh, so the children part mm -hmm. okay so as far as as far as the uh, as far as inviting guests in general, again, you should have a purpose, a purpose of why you're inviting guests. Uh, as far as the uh, children telling the parents what to do with their house, children are generally not allowed to tell the parents to do anything. Not when they're young and not when they're old. Why? It's called kibud avayim, honoring your parents. In fact, if you look at the halachot of kibud avayim, even if your parent makes a mistake, you are forbidden from telling them outright that they made a mistake. You have to tell them indirectly. Your father says, yeah, I think that uh, Shabbat ends at uh, 6.30. And you know it ends at 7 or at 7.30. So you can't tell, no, Abba, you're wrong. You know what you're talking about. No, you can't do that. You know what you're doing. You can't do that. What are you going to do? Abba, I don't know. I think it says it in, in, this, in this paper what time. Can you check over there? What does it say over there? What does it say over there? I think it says a different time. I think. Don't be so sure, sure of yourself that you know better than your Abba or your Ima. Why? You're nothing. You wouldn't be a nothing. You would be a nothing still if they didn't bring you to the world. And if you tell you talk to your father or your mother like they're your friend, Hashem Yachem Alecha. What they're gonna do to you in Shemaim, how they're gonna cook you. How they're gonna cook you. Why? Kibudabayim, it's a big deal. It's a very hard mitzvah though. Why? Because we get comfortable with our parents. We get very comfortable with our parents, we get very friendly with our parents. But the point is you have to honor your parents in a big way. You're not allowed to sit in their chair. Now if you know there's a chair in the house, it's your father's chair, you're not allowed to sit in it. Never allowed to yell at them. Never allowed to curse them. Chas v'shalom, never allowed to hit them. Now, person needs to know that if you're going to treat your father or your mom like a friend, it's only a matter of time before you're going to do one of these things. Why? Because you curse your friends. You yell at your friends. You do all types of things to your friends. And they're going to do all types of things to you. Eventually. Shemaim. Duma. And his friends. And they do. So a person needs to know, first and foremost, Talk to your parents. This is different from everybody else. This is different from everybody else. You have to honor them even if you don't agree with them. Even if they're wrong. Even if a lot of things. Why? Because says so. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the Ten Commandments. So a person needs to know that if the parent is making a mistake by inviting someone to their house that's not necessarily a good person. You can't tell now, nah, Ima, you're not allowed to invite this guy. You're not allowed to invite this girl. No, they're bad for you. You can't do that. It's first of all, it's their house. Who are you to tell them anything? Even if they weren't your parent. Second of all, uh, you're not allowed to do such a thing. So you have to again do things indirectly. Indirectly. You say, you know, uh, is that the person that uh, just robbed three banks? I just read the article. Is that is this him? Is that the person that uh, hurt such and such down the street? Is that the, you know you have to do it indirectly, soft, not uh, as if you're almost like reminding them of something that they you may or may not know, but you kind of remember, but it may not be him. You have to uh, tread carefully. Very very difficult because you have to be alert, like a uh, you know it's, uh, it's you have to be very very alert of all the things that you say. Point being is that if a child is telling his parents what to do and how to do it, they're already mistaken. Now, this is usually the product of a secular life. This is usually the product of a secular life where the parent gave the kid pretty much everything that the kid wants their whole life. Even the freedom to talk to the parent any way that they want. So the kid doesn't see anything wrong with talking to their parent any way they want because they allowed them to do it to a certain extent. So they yelled at the parent a bunch of times and the parent didn't do anything. They cursed the parent a few times and the parent didn't do enough. They did what they told the parent what to do a bunch of times and the parent uh, you know reacted as if uh, you know it, it's okay. 
So the kid doesn't know it's wrong, and the, and the parent doesn't know it's wrong. Neither one knows it's wrong. So you can't just go tell the kid right now, listen, you're uh, the worst person in the world. What do you mean the worst person in the world? You taught me to do this. You told me that I should talk to you freely and like you're my friend. A lot of parents are stupid. They think that, you know, their kids are their friend. No, no, she's my friend, not my daughter. She's my friend, not my, he's my friend, not my son. Not my friend. They're your kid. They're not, your, they're not friends. They're not supposed to be friends. Once they become friends, they become little Hitlers. That's what happens. That's what happens. Kamara says, why is the skin, why is the skin of a human being become tame after he dies in reality it's not tame why you're alive it's not tame your skin's not tame it's not impure how come the second that a person dies becomes tame how come Kamara says after a parent dies the kids forget about all the good that the parent did what do you think about how much money you leave us how much money you leave us who gets the house who gets the car who gets the jewelry? Who gets the business? Who gets this? And they start fighting. They start fighting amongst each other. I'm going to get the house. I'm going to get the business. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. ah. They start fighting so much. Where they say, you know what? Okay, you take the car. You take the house. Fine. I'm taking Abba's skin. I'm going to put it on my wall. I'll make it a carpet. To show how much I love Abba. To show how much I love Ima. I'm going to put on skin. As a nice jacket. I'm going to wear it. But it says that if it wasn't for the skin becoming tamer, the kids would use it as carpets. Bad education continues to get worse. And the, the, the masim of the, of the parents uh, unfortunately have uh, fruits. So a kid that talks to their parents in a certain way, it's a result of certain things that the parents did. Doesn't mean it's right. But it's much more difficult to fix. It's impossible to fix without Torah. Impossible to fix. You tell an average kid, listen, you shouldn't talk to your father that way. You should never call your father or your mother by their first name. Sometimes you see these uh, kids, hey, David, come here. Who's David? You're looking for him. Oh, that, that's your dad? You call him by first name? It's forbidden. Or it's like they ask him for the car. No, give me the car. Give me the car. Like they owe you something. This is wrong. This is the pe person's going to get gained on for this. They're going to get punished for it. Why? Say it's, uh, it's forbidden. But whose fault is it really? The parents. The parents gave them the freedom to do whatever they want, talk to them however they want, and uh, get a secular education. And in essence, the kid thinks that he came from a monkey. So that's the education that the father gave him, that he came from a monkey. So that's a, uh, one of the uh, Chachamim, Rav uh, Kaminetsky. Rav Kaminetsky was once on a uh, uh, plane with his son, the current one of the Gdolei in America, Rav Shmuel Kaminetsky, that was the son, was still a young kid at the time. And uh, they were sitting next to a uh, well-known professor. And he was with his son. And the whole flight, the professor had his kid next to him, and the whole flight, every few minutes, the, uh, the kid would say, uh, Dad, I'm thirsty. So the professor would get up and go, Stewardess, please, can I have water for my kid? Okay. Dad, I'm hungry. So the dad, professor, you know, a million dollar professor over here, Harvard University, gets up, goes to the stewardess, you have something for my kid to eat, it's a long flight. Okay. Dad, I'm cold. Okay, so he gets up, stewardess, you have uh, maybe a blanket? Blanket for my kid. Okay. Dad, it's not comfortable. Is there any anything? Gets up, professor. You have any pillows for my kid? You know, it's uncomfortable. Every few minutes, the whole flight, ten hours flight, he's serving his kid. But the whole time he's not even bothered by his kid and serving his kid. He's used to it already. He does it all day all night. What is he bothered by? The whole time he's watching the rabbi, Rav Kaminetsky, and the opposite is happening there. Every so often, the kid, Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, when he was little Shmuel, he says, Abba, you thirsty? You want, you want something to drink? No, no, son, no. Keep learning. Abba, you uh, you hungry? You want me to get you something to eat? We, Ima made some sandwiches, kosher. You want something to eat? Hungry, maybe? No, 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 son. It's okay. Keep learning. Abba, here's a pillow. Maybe you're tired. You want something? No. 
Abba, you maybe it's cold in the plane. Here, blanket. The whole time, his kid is giving him. So at the end of the flight, the little professor from Harvard University comes to the rabbi. Doesn't know it's the Gedola Dora of Kamenetsky. Think it's just another Jew. He says, I don't understand. I'm a famous professor. I'm a very learned person. And yet, I don't understand how you just, I don't know, regular person have, 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 have done such a better job at educating your kid. He goes, wait, what? He says, the whole time, my kid is asking, you know, dad, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. Whereas you have trained your kid, educated your kid, the whole time he's telling you, Abba, you want this, Abba, you want that, Abba, you want one. Well, the whole time he's serving you, how'd you do it? I have Kaminetsky, Allah love Shalom system, the following. He says, you see, Mr. Professor, Mr. Professor, doctor, doctor, professor, what did you teach your kid? You taught your kid that you came from a monkey, right? He goes, yeah, of course, evolution, Darwin, yeah, well, of course, why? Where do you think we came from? He goes, oh, okay, so you, you taught him you came from a monkey, right? So what is your kid? Your kid thought that the more you develop, the further you are from the monkey, the more developed you are from the monkey. Which means you, as his father, are closer to a monkey than he is. Therefore, you should serve him. You're closer to being a monkey. So therefore, you, you should serve him. He's more superior than you. Me and my nation, my people, Am Yisrael, we taught our kids that we come from HaKadosh Baruch Hu created Adam Rishon, the complete human being. And every generation is lesser and lesser and lesser than the generation before it. You're never going to have a bigger rabbi today than there was a hundred years ago. You're never going to have a rabbi a hundred years ago be bigger than the rabbis of 500 years ago. Never going to be. There's a steady decline of the generation. So you see, doctor, my son understands that I am closer to the complete human being to Adam Rishon, I am closer to Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov, our forefathers. I am closer than to Moshe Rabbeinu, the prophet of all prophets that spoke to God face to face. I'm closer to them. Therefore my son knows that he's inferior to me and therefore he serves me. If you want to teach your kid that he came from a monkey, of course you must serve him. Why? You are closer to being a monkey than he is. But if you teach your kid that he came from God, then surely your kid will serve you because he knows that you are superior to him. Bezat Hashem, this will teach us just enough, just enough to know that not only did we not come from monkeys, but we should treat our kids in such a way that they also know they didn't come from monkeys by teaching them a life full of Torah, mitzvot, and gemilut chasadim. Baruch Adonai Amen ve Amen.